Okay, guys, good to see you. Now, guys, don't fall for the snare of Satan. We haven't even begun yet, and we have the Mohammedans already barking. Palestine, this tool of the devil, is already barking in the comment section to distract you. So, guys, help me to help you. Don't fall for their traps. They're scared. They know that they can't defend their God or their prophet or their book. So they're trying to distract you because they know their fake God, fake prophet, and fake book <clears throat> has been destroyed and will continue to be destroyed by the power of Jehovah Jesus Christ, the Father, Son, the love of the Spirit, our God and Savior, Lord Jesus, Muhammad's God and destroyer. Please, brethren, and your everyone else, do not engage the trolls in the comment section because Palestine's going to come on my stream yard in a minute to try to prove me wrong, because this is an open challenge to Mohammedans. Muslims prove me wrong. Quran proves Jesus is God. And he was stupid enough to quote Surah Al-Maidah, chapter 5, verse 72. They're not going to be barking in the comment section. We don't let them get away with commenting in the comment section. They're going to come on StreamYard and defend their book. <clears throat> but they can't, because Muhammad is a false prophet under the feet of Jesus Christ. Jesus is alive. He is Lord. Muhammad is dead and buried under the feet of Jesus. So, guys, help me to help you. Number one, be prayed up. Ask the Holy Spirit to fill me, fill you. Ask the Holy Spirit to give me the health, the strength, the vigor, the holiness, the purity to glorify Jesus Christ. Ask the Holy Spirit to shield us from Satan and these barking dogs and muzzle them. Ask the Holy Spirit to help me to bless you with wisdom and knowledge from the Spirit. Number two, hit the like button. And share this link on your social media platforms. And number three, you know this is a class session and we want the Holy Spirit to teach. May he bless the internet connection, the audiovisual qualities. So when it's class, we do not engage. We give our undivided attention to the teacher and we pray the Holy Spirit is the teacher, not me. We are disciples of the Spirit. I'm your servant. You're not my disciples. So let's honor those rules. You already know how Satan works through his children. They will distract you. Don't fall for it. And I'm going to share the StreamYard link for the Mohammedans to come in to defend their religion. They can't. It's impossible. You can't defend Muhammad and his fake God. Islam is a lie from the pit of hell. Jesus is the truth. And he's God over Muhammad and I love the Quran. The fathers love the companion of the spirit. But good to see you guys. It's been a while. If you're wondering where I've been, I've been busy researching. I've been busy studying i've been busy compiling facts for articles okay so if you go to my blog i have uploaded several new articles and i continue to do so because god has blessed me to call me into the ministry where i devote myself entirely to studying researching preparing articles sessions providing facts that are irrefutable by the power of the holy spirit and more importantly, do, studying for my own growth, to feast on the Lord's table, to feast off the flesh of Jesus Christ, to drink from the precious blood of Jesus Christ, to study his word, to know his word, to apply his word, to love and obey and proclaim his word. Because <clears throat> we cannot love God enough. We cannot worship him enough. We cannot obey him enough. We cannot thank him enough. We cannot glorify him enough. We need to do more, our utmost for his highest. So pray for me. And as I'm getting older, my sight is giving out. So pray that if the Lord is pleased, that my sight will stay strong, my vision and my throat. So with my dying breath and my last moment on this earth, I will glorify Jesus and use my eyes to focus on his word and not use it to sin. So guys, good to see you. It's been a while. We got a lot of topics to be discussing in the upcoming weeks. If the Lord is pleased, if the Lord wills. Good to see you, Candace. It's been a while. Good to see Sarah and everyone else, all of you. So let's begin in prayer. In fact, Protestant Believer is joining us. So I think he's going to help me to help you, but I'm scared because I don't know if Protestant Believer has checked the audio of his computer like he did yesterday with my good friend James Snap. I was about to snap on Protestant because we tried to play a video and the sound wasn't working. So I'm scared of Protestant Believer. He's a blessing. He helps me to help you. He serves me to serve you. But at the same time, he is brought into my life. Adam Seeker has been brought into my life. Hussein Meshni has been brought into my life to test me. They are sent into my life to test me, to show me that I am weak, sinful, decrepit, 
and I need to yield to the Spirit and be filled with the Spirit more and more so I can die to my sinfulness, my weaknesses and perfections, one of which is impatience. So this man has been sent in my life to test me so I can learn to be patient. Glory to the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So, Protestant, is your sound working? Let me get the clip ready, but we're not taking calls yet because there's some things I want to share. Okay, so let's do this here. In Jesus' name, invite. Here it is, Mohammedans, I'm challenging you. Come and prove me wrong. Here it is. Come and prove me wrong. To be honest with you, it is a tie between Hussein Meshni, Orthochristos, and Adam Seeker. Hussein Meshni makes me want to hit my head against the wall and take a sledgehammer to myself. Hussein Meshni, because why? I love the brother, and I'm usually on his channel every night, usually, if I'm not busy. But the man is probably the most pathetic moderator in the planet. He sucks as a moderator. I'll go on a stream yard. He'll let the Muslims talk over and not address points and just sit there smiling. Hey, 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 hey. So Adam Seeker's up there. But I, I really think it's Hussein. It's like I want to take him and headbutt him until I knock some sense into his skull. I'm telling you, man. You should see what he does to me. Well, I'm Muslims. Uh, Hussein, are you going to sit there? In fact, it got so bad. No, Rob, I do. Hussein's my brother in the Lord. And see, I'm starting to reconsider Calvinism, Ortho Christos. Why? Because Hussein and Adam Seeker and Protestant believer are convincing me things are predestined because I have no choice that Protestant is my brother in Jesus Christ. I have no choice that Adam, Adam Seeker is my brother in Jesus Christ. I have no choice that Hussein Meshni is my brother in Jesus Christ. And they have no choice that I'm their brother in Christ. Hopefully that we're all truly born of the spirit, not the seed. So because I have no choice, I'm probably reconsidering Calvinism because they make a strong case things are predestined, right? Because I had no say-so and them being my brothers and sisters in Christ. But if you want to see me lose my testimony and flip my lid and chew out Hussein, go watch the second discussion I had with Nadir Ahmed where Hussein could not control the format, and I left. And then several minutes later, he banned Nadir proving I was right again. I got to hurt that man. I got to really physically beat him to repentance out of love. I will physically lay hands on him, beat that man to a bloody pulp so I can lay hands and bless him and repent. I got to, I got to hurt him. I got to beat him up and repent. Okay. Now, Protestant, are you going to make me eat my words and say that you're even worse than Hussein Meshmi? Hello? So are you going to make me eat my words and say that you're oh. worse than Hussein Meshmi? Um, I'm really hoping not. I uh, hope so. You're scaring me. <laughs> no, I think I got it figured out, man. I uh, I forgot every time I go get on the stream yard, it resets, and I have to go into stream yard and <clears throat> and uh, reset everything. Almost said I have big guns. I don't pray for me, Rob, so I can start hitting the weights again to get my skin tight and streamlined. Not for vanity, but for the Lord Jesus. Because just let you know, because God in his mercy and love blessed me to lose weight drastically, and he's enabled me by his mercy and love to keep it off, and I pray keep it off. The problem is, because I lost it, it wasn't that quick. I mean, it took me years. Sadly, and I don't mean to gross people out, but I have, my belly here is like loose, and I'm trying to tighten it up, so I don't know what to do. But glory to God, at least I lost the weight. That was more important for me than looks, because no matter how lean I get, I'll always be better looking than all of you. Even when I was heavy, I was better looking than all of you, especially this Kenny Rogers wannabe. Okay, right? uh, let me give you give it a test real quick and make sure that it's working here. Okay. All right, go ahead, sir. Yeah, before I lose my testimony. It works, it works, it works perfectly, man. man. All right. Now, one thing I've noticed, my right arm, this side, my right arm, you can see my muscles are smaller than the left because for some reason, though I write with my right hand, when I strike, I strike with my left hand and my left foot. Because of my body structure, I have narrow shoulders and wide hips just genetically. For some reason, when I used to do martial arts, kickboxing, I would always prefer to kick with my left leg. 
I don't know what it is about my structure. I don't know if it's because maybe my hunchback and whatever it is. I couldn't kick as comfortably or as accurately with my right, even though I write with my right. So I preferred my left side. And so because I would kick with my left side, I would use my left hand more than the right, even though I write with my right hand. So I'm weird. Like, see, even the way I write and I train, I'm, I'm confused. I'm like just a weirdo, dude. You think if you're right-handed, you're going to use your right. No, I write with my right, but with my left, you see? Oh, anyway, who cares, man? Does anybody care about my issues and my problems and my physiological deformities? And does anyone care that you're always blaming someone else for your mistakes? Does anyone? Kenny Rogers? Uh, anyone dude, care? I, I blame myself this time, remember? So, uh, oh, I was you blame, the blame, you blame this time. actually, you blame... Streamyard, stop lying, sir. I caught no, you. No, no, no. I, I said I didn't check the Streamyard. It was that that's my fault. I didn't check Streamyard. I should have checked Streamyard first. Okay. So anyway. So well, it was hello. my bad, my fault, my bad. See. All right. Now, with that said, I want to bring up some Bible verses. So if you can go to BibleGateway.com, we're going to quote some verses, put things in perspective, play a few kips and pray, and we're going to begin. We got a lot to discuss. All right. So, brother, if you can. Sorry, I'm getting distracted. I Here, I'm on StreamYard. Isn't it ironic? When I'm on StreamYard, they want to call me on Skype. When I want to go on Skype, then they come and bombard my comment section. Sam, that means you are not a common man. Now, I know Sorel is a brother in Jesus Christ, so he means well. I know you mean that, brother. You say this out of love for Jesus because I know you're a Christian. But one thing I want to say, brother, without hurting your feelings, because I love you. And I want the best for you. Like this man makes me lose my patience and makes me want to pull my hair, but not my hair on the top of my head. He wants he makes me want to pull my nose hairs, right? Because I have no hair on top of my head. I just want you to understand that I may not be a Kamun man, but I may be a common man. I don't know what Kamun is, but I can tell you. I'm not common, so I don't know about Kamun. Whoever Kamun is, give him my regards. <laughs> All right. Why are you laughing, bro? <laughs> Why are you laughing, sir? Okay. I'm laughing with you. I'm laughing with you, man. Now, here, guys, I want to give you the biblical basis why I pray the way I do when I ask the Spirit to illuminate us, ask the Spirit to guide us, ask the Spirit to anoint the words of my mouth to speak, with clarity because remember the bible is given to teach us how to live for god how to love god how to pray to god how to worship god how to fast how to sing how to serve right it governs all of our life to live in a manner that glorifies the lord jesus christ and every sphere of life now ephesians 1 17 18 semicolon ephesians 1 17 18 semicolon and then 6, 19 to 20. Because I want to show you from the example of my hero, the Apostle Paul. May we all be like Paul who all who tried to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no 16 in Ephesians, sir. So you're starting again. What was the second? I said 6, 19 to 20, sir. Oh, 6. Did I say 16? I don't think I did. You're going to blame me for your sins. No, I probably heard 16, but you probably said 6. So Because you're thinking of Mark 16, 19 to 20. Okay, now here, sp the Spirit filling Paul... Inspiring Paul, the holy, blessed slave and apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look what he says. Guys, pay attention. Here's the biblical basis for why we pray the way we do. Okay, pay attention, guys. Class begins. Don't be distracted. The Muslims will have a chance to come and then refute my arguments. But let's set it up. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit. Now, it should be capitalized S, the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Now, understand what he's praying. He's asking the Father of the Lord Jesus for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ and we who belong to the Lord to send the Holy Spirit to give us wisdom and revelation. Spirit of wisdom and revelation means a spirit who grants wisdom, make us wise to understand the revelation so that we can get to know God more completely and perfectly. So now let's break this down, guys. Listen so we can understand. Asking the Holy Spirit to teach and save me from error and stammering confusion to bring all glory to the Lord Jesus, no attention to myself, and bless Protestant to help me to help you. 
<clears throat> Here, notice the goal of knowledge. The goal of knowledge is not to be intelligent or wise <clears throat> in order to be puffed up. The goal of true knowledge that's from God is for the purpose of getting to know God truly, getting to know God as he is, comprehending the true nature of God and the persons of the Godhead more completely in order to love him more intimately and love him for who he is, love him for what he is, and not love a God after your own vain desires and imagination. You understand the goal? Any revelation that the Holy Spirit gives us, revelation from the Holy Spirit, is for the purpose of getting to know God more completely, more accurately, more truly, so that you can love him for who he is and all the mistaken views and ideas you have about God. By this knowledge of the Spirit, those views that are contrary to who God is will be removed so that we can know God more completely and perfectly and love him for who he is and as he is, not loving a God after our own vain desires and understanding that we think is the God of Scripture. Do you understand that? First lesson. Before I move on, are you guys understanding this point? I can't move on without you letting me know because I trust the Holy Spirit to enable me to speak clearly to glorify Jesus and help you. Ephesians 1, 17, 18. Okay, so understand that. This is why many people think they love the God of the Bible, but in reality, they have erected an idol, a false God that they think is the God of the Bible. Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, Unitarians, right? Modalists, Muslims. They think they worship the God revealed in Scripture in Jesus, but they're worshiping an idol after their own vain thinking and desires. The God of the philosophers or the God of of human tradition, gods erected by Satan, supplanting the true God revealed in Christ and in Scripture. Okay? So this is the goal. So what do we pray? Holy Spirit, you've been sent to us as the gift of the Father and Son to train us, to discipline us, to strengthen us, to perfect us and illuminate us, to know God as he is and love him for who he is and love him more passionately. Yep, the God of rabbinic Judaism. What else does the Holy Spirit do? Right? Give the spirit of wisdom and revelation, knowledge of him, the eyes. So notice your spiritual eyes. May the Holy Spirit perfect our spiritual eyes and our physical eyes to see through the eyes of the spirit. Open your minds, your hearts, your eyes, your spiritual eyes, the eyes of your understanding to be enlightened. See, that's why we pray the way I do. So that you may know and have no doubt of the hope of your calling. What does that mean? God has called you to a hope. This is what we hope for. This is what we long for. This is what we expect will happen. What is the hope that God has called us to? Immortal life, everlasting existence in the presence of the trying God, beholding God as he is and being flooded in his love, joy, and peace. No more pain, no more suffering, no more death, no more sin, no more rebellion. That's the hope that he's called you to. Okay? And to know, as the Holy Spirit reveals to you, the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. To know the inheritance you have, the spiritual blessings and riches that God has given you if you're united to Christ and one of his holy ones. How glorious your inheritance is. An inheritance... That is incorruptible, imperishable. That is everlasting. And what is the inheritance that God has for you? Where you will dwell in a new heaven, new earth. An earth free of pain, destruction, disease, decay, misery, slander, evil, murder. All of that erased. A world of perfect righteousness, of perfect love, joy, peace, and fellowship. A world where you will dwell in glorified physical bodies, deathless, morally incorruptible. A world in which God will be seen in visible splendor, and you will walk with God, and he'll walk with you, and walk with one another. And the earth becomes yours, your possession, and angels serving you. That's your inheritance. 
So you see why I pray these prayers? Keisha, how you doing, sister? Let me bless the sister in the Lord. There you go. Keisha, by the way, if you guys don't know who the sister is, she is a sister who loves Jesus, and she's a singer. So I made her a mod because one day I'm going to have her come and sing praises to Jesus Christ. Good to see you, sister. You're now a mod. All right, so there you go, guys. You see now why I pray, Holy Spirit, open our eyes and our ears. You guys understand? Okay, now, here's another thing why I asked Holy Spirit to loosen my tongue and anoint my mouth to speak clearly. Ephesians 6, 19 to 20. So let's, now let me give you the biblical basis for why I asked the Spirit to help me to pray in accord with the scripture that he has produced to teach us how to pray, how to fast, how to live, how to obey, how to serve, how to love, how to worship. And the things not to do. There you go. Ephesians 6, 19. There you go. Read it. So Paul is asking the saints to pray for him. And what does he want you to pray? What is he asking you to pray? And I'm asking you because all of us need to be like Paul, who tried to be like Jesus, because he's a hero whom the Lord raised up with the other holy apostles and prophets to be our example, like the church fathers. Pray for me. For what? That utterance may be given to me. Do you catch it? I pray and I ask you to pray that the Holy Spirit will give me the words to utter. Give me the right words to speak. And that I may open my mouth boldly. That the Holy Spirit will empower me to speak boldly. Not to be politically correct. Not to tickle ears. So I can make known the mystery of the gospel. The good news. Now let me explain this word mysterion. Are you ready? You guys are ready for spiritual meat, right? That's why you're here. Pray if the Lord is pleased to increase our numbers for his glory, not for my praise. And keep me humble and teachable. teachable. Because, Tweety, when I see spiritual whores and dogs like you, you disgust me. So I got to yell at you because your mommy didn't yell at you and spank you, you spiritual bastard. So there you go. Now, coming back to the issue. What does the word mystery mean in Greek, mysterion? What does it mean? Mysterion the Greek word means something veiled, something hidden that now is being unveiled, unhidden. A mystery means something veiled, something hidden, unknown, until it's unveiled, revealed, and made known. So what Paul is saying is God has now appointed me to proclaim the good news of that revelation that was hidden but now God has disclosed it through us. Okay? You understand what it means? And so now notice what Paul says, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Now, when Paul wrote this, people don't know, he was in prison. So Paul is saying, I'm in prison. They throw me in prison. They've imprisoned me because I boldly proclaim this hidden knowledge that God has now unveiled in the proclamation of the good news of Jesus Christ. And for that, I've been thrown in prison. And now notice what else he says to pray. Pray that in it, in these chains, being a prisoner, that I don't fear, that I don't shrink back, I don't betray or deny the Lord, but I speak boldly as I ought to speak. You see why I pray the prayers I do? Because Paul set an example by the Spirit, teaching us what to pray for, how to pray, and how to conduct ourselves. You guys catch it? Is that clear? Before I move on? Is that clear? Because now I want to share two stories, miraculous stories, verifiable stories that can be verified today. One that I heard at a service yesterday and one from my own brother, and we're going to begin. So now, brother, I'm going to give you this link. You're going to start at the 8-minute, 25-second mark. 8-minute, 25-second mark. Eight okay. minutes, 25 second mark. Now I'm going to share two verifiable miracles. One with my oldest brother. I'm the youngest of six. And now this one that I heard the other day. And I witnessed to this. Now watch here. Because our God is real. The God of the Bible is real. He is reality. The creator of all things. And the Bible is his voice. Perfectly preserved. Trust it and have no doubt. So there it is. Here, let me share the link in the comment section. So here you go. Eight minute, 25 second mark, sir. All right, here we 
we go. That we need to be asking for. I actually have a friend of mine who prays like that. His name is Tony, and I was invited to go speak to about 500 pastors, do some training in Ethiopia. And I asked Tony to come because <laughs> Tony's a heck of a lot of fun to be around. Tony had, uh, his surgeon told him, you need your rotator cuff replaced, right shoulder. Like, it, it's bad. And he goes, listen, doc, I'm going to go to Ethiopia, and I'm going to ask the pastors there to pray for me. Because they're poor, they're persecuted, they have massive faith. I think they can pray a yes out of God for my shoulder. And I said, okay, Tony, I will do that for you. Like, I'll ask the pastor to pray for you, but you just got to understand, when they lay hands on you and pray, I'm going to lay hands on you also. And if you get healed, I'm totally taking credit. So into the conference, I said to the pastors, if any of you regularly pray for healing in your church, just come on forward. Tony, my friend, his right shoulder is, has been injured. They say it needs surgery. Can you pray healing over him? So about six guys come up. And about two minutes into the prayer, my hand is on his left shoulder. I feel this kind of vibration. And I thought th there was an old man behind him leaning way over. I thought the old guy's like shaking. Or, or Tony's getting healed. One or the other. And then I started to feel this heat in his shoulder. You ever pick up a coffee cup and you feel like it's warm inside? And now his right shoulder is the one that's injured. My, my hand was on his left shoulder. It starts to get warm and I thought, doggone, I think he might be getting healed. And so after the prayer was over, we went and sat back down. We were on the stage because in Africa, dignitaries are put on the stage, visitors, you know. They, they started worshiping again. I'm just curious. I go, so Tony, what are you? What do you feel? And he goes, I feel no pain. For five years, he had been in constant pain. For five years, he hadn't lifted his hand above his shoulder. I said, okay, but I, you know, that could have just been, I don't know, psychosomatic. He feels no pain. I said, how's your mobility? And as others were raising their hand in worship, he just went. But again, doubting Thomas, I thought, well, that could be like an adrenaline rush, you know? The moment I knew he was healed, after the service, we're leaving, he picked up his backpack, threw it over his shoulder, took one step, and froze because he hadn't done that for five years. Jesus not only healed his shoulder, he healed the muscle memory of protecting an injured shoulder. That was 15 years ago. Tony still not had surgery. God healed him. Wow. Those are the kind of... What <clears throat> Did you hear? That was 15 years ago. Something to you that may be insignificant. God miraculously healed the man's shoulder through the prayers of faithful, humble servants in Ethiopia who have nothing of the world and they have everything in Jesus. They don't have garages or cars or internet or homes, but what they have is infinitely greater than what we have in America the Lord Jesus Christ, and they know he's real, he's alive. So I'm going to play that one more time. Let's play one more time, 8 minute, 25 second mark. One more time. Okay. And I can definitely say that I've had that surgery, and I know the pain that's involved with it, and it's excruciating. Say it again a little louder because we can hear you. What happened? I've had, that, I've had the shoulder cuff uh, surgery, and I've had that pain. I've had, the, you know, where it actually tore when it tore. And that is the worst pain I've ever had. Well, you should have told me we would have sent you to Ethiopia. Oh, you have little faith. Yeah. <laughs> but instead, they did surgery on me. So, okay. One more time. Eight minute, 25 second mark. I actually have a friend of mine who prays like that. His name is Tony, and I was invited to go speak to about 500 pastors, do some training in Ethiopia. And I asked Tony to come because <laughs> Tony's a heck of a lot of fun to be around. Tony had, uh, his surgeon told him, you need your rotator cuff replaced, right shoulder. Like, it, it's bad. And he goes, listen, doc, I'm going to go to Ethiopia, and I'm going to ask the pastors there to pray for me. Because they're poor, they're persecuted, they have massive faith. I think they can pray a yes out of God for my shoulder. And I said, okay, Tony, I will do that for you. Like, I'll ask the pastor to pray for you, but you just got to understand, when they lay hands on you and pray, I'm going to lay hands on you also. And if you get healed, I'm totally taking credit. 
So into the conference, I said to the pastors, if any of you regularly pray for healing in your church, just come on forward. Tony, my friend, his right shoulder is, has been injured. They say it needs surgery. Can you pray healing over him? So about six guys come up. And about two minutes into the prayer, my hand is on his left shoulder. I feel this kind of vibration. And I thought that there was an old man behind him leaning way over. I thought the old guy's like shaking. Or, or Tony's getting healed. One or the other. And then I started to feel this heat in his shoulder. You ever pick up a coffee cup and you feel like it's warm inside? And now his right shoulder is the one that's injured. My, my hand was on his left shoulder. It starts to get warm and I thought, doggone, I think he might be getting healed. And so after the prayer was over, we went and sat back down. We were on the stage, because in Africa, dignitaries are put on the stage, visitors, you know. They, they started worshiping again. I'm just curious, I go, so Tony, well, like, what do you feel? And he goes, I feel no pain. For five years, he had been in constant pain. For five years, he hadn't lifted his hand above his shoulder. I said, okay, but I, you know, that could have just been, I don't know, psychosomatic, he feels no pain. I said, how's your mobility? And as others were raising their hand in worship, he just went. But again, doubting Thomas, I thought, well, that could be like an adrenaline rush, you know? The moment I knew he was healed, after the service, we're leaving, he picked up his backpack, threw it over his shoulder, took one step, and froze because he hadn't done that for five years. Jesus not only healed his shoulder, he healed the muscle memory of protecting an injured shoulder. That was 15 years ago. Tony still not had surgery. God healed him. Okay, that's a, that's a Those are the kind of... Okay, you see that, right? You see, our Lord is real, but you have to believe. It will be done according to your faith. So there you go, another, and this is his friend, and they're still in contact. 15 years later, miraculously healed, <clears throat> just like it's brand new, because that's the God we serve. Now, I'm going to share a story now. For the life of me, I don't know why. I never shared this before. I don't know why. It just dawned on me. This is something I know for years because I'm the youngest of six. And we're going to begin in prayer. We're going to begin the session. And I want to talk a little more about John chapter 2, something I've discussed in previous sessions. But remember, we're creatures of repetition. We need to hear something repetitively over and over again until it becomes second nature by the power of the Holy Spirit. We understand it correctly and present the facts clearly to glorify the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, who lives and the Bible being the miraculous voice of our God. Don't doubt your Bible is miraculous. Don't doubt it. Now, I'm the youngest of six. My oldest is a boy, a brother. The oldest sibling is a brother, and I'm the youngest. Now, I happen to be the best looking of the bunch. That's a, that's a given. Hey, you better not laugh, sir. Okay? <laughs> I hear you laughing in your heart, bro. All right. My oldest brother, he's uh, 66 years old. I'm 50. So, the youngest of six. Now, here, well, here's what's ironic. I've known this story for over 30 years. And I don't know why I never shared it with you guys. I really don't know why I never shared it with you guys. But now let me tell you a story. My brother is one of the over 30 million people who had an out-of-body experience. My brother had an out-of-body experience, witnessed by his wife, who at that time was his girlfriend. And it dawned on me, why haven't I shared this story? In fact, I was at my brother's place this weekend. Now, you hear what you want to hear something that sucks? My oldest brother, his wife, they have two grown daughters. They're grown and married with kids, right? Now, watch here. I went to his house to pick up a bicycle. He's, there's a bicycle he doesn't ride. So he gave it to me. So I rode back. Now, being stupid and gullible, I put my bicycle outside the door of my apartment. I'm on the second floor. It's a nice apartment. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I am content with it. Thank you, Lord. I rent. Sad thing about where I'm at is there is no price cap, so they can raise the rent as much as they want, but pray God will preserve me. They don't raise it anymore by next year. Can't afford it, but God is good. We trust in him. Now, notice how stupid and gullible I am. He gave me the bicycle. <clears throat> I put it outside the door thinking, hey, it's an apartment complex. We all know each other. Today, I opened the door, and someone stole it. It's gone. For the past 
I picked it up Saturday. So what's today, brother? Wednesday? So Saturday night, Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, it was out there, right in front of my door, second floor. Today, I opened the door, let my cat out, gone. This bicycle that my brother gave me so I could ride to burn some more calories. I woke up, it's gone, no more riding you in the moonlight. But anyway, it's related to the story. So my brother and I were reminiscing, reminiscing, sound intelligent, reminiscing, right? And we were talking about Jesus Christ, our Lord, and death and the afterlife. He then repeated this experience. True story. His wife was there sitting next to him. I've known this story for over 30 years. I've heard this story repeatedly, but it was mentioned again. Right? Many, yeah, I think many of Butch told it. So my brother, this was probably late 70s, early 80s. <clears throat> At that time, she wasn't his wife. <clears throat> was his girlfriend. True story. She was telling me the details, and he told me what he saw. He was there at the house. He was having dinner. And all of a sudden, I guess he had a heart attack because she was telling me his vein on the left. She goes, she could see it jumping out of his neck. It was jumping, right? She goes, I saw it. She was even describing it just a Saturday. Out of his neck, it was like coming out almost like it was going to explode from his neck. Okay? Okay, so out of his neck. And then he tells me what he saw. He had an out-of-body experience. He goes... As I'm fading, and she was telling me, I could see him. He was slumping slowly. She was describing the scene, guys. Slumping slowly, slowly, slowly. All of a sudden, he woke up. Now, he told me what he saw. He goes, as I'm fading, I see a man standing by the ceiling. A man. He could see his, I guess, his torso and head wearing white. He goes, he didn't speak with his mouth. He spoke mind to mind. It's my brother telling me. Said it to me this Saturday. And he told me, come, I have your cure. Come, I have your cure. So he's about to leave to go with the man. He goes, I saw the man. I could see him out of the ceiling. Right? He's wearing white. And he goes, the ecstasy and the joy and the peace I felt. He goes, beyond description. The joy and the peace I was feeling, you can't describe it. So he said, come. I have your cure. He goes, but then he could hear his now wife yelling, Art, Art, get up, get up. Don't, don't, you know, you know, go home. Don't stay here. As he was hearing her, right, <clears throat> he then looked to the man and he said, basically, I don't want to mention her name. He goes, yeah, but this poor woman, she's all by herself. I don't want to leave her. So the man, he goes, he wasn't speaking with his mouth. He's speaking mind to mind. He goes, so you want to stay behind for her? He goes, yes, she's all by herself. He goes, okay, I bless you and her. She's yours and you're hers. You are hers. And then he woke up like nothing happened. And she was there telling me. He was like fading, fading, and the vein coming out of his neck. And all of a sudden, he just woke up. He's like, what's going on? Like nothing happened. And they've been with each other ever since. They've been with each other ever since. Now, that was late 70s, early 80s. They've been with each other ever since. And now we're in 2000, 22. Two grown women, right? Two daughters, grown women, and they have five grandchildren. God bless them and bring them to the feet of Jesus Christ. So I don't know why I never share that. My brother had an out-of-body experience. And one common feature in out-of-body experiences, they'll tell you that when you see you don't speak with the mouth. You speak mind to mind. You communicate within the person's mind. And you hear and they hear you. That's a common feature. It's been documented. Over 30 million near-death out-of-body experiences. And my brother is one of them. And again, let me repeat what he said. He goes, when he saw the man, he was dressed in white. He goes, come, I have your cure. And he goes, the joy, the peace, what I felt. Ecstasy. He goes, you couldn't describe it. But she kept screaming because she didn't want him to die in her apartment. She was afraid. What are you going to think? They're going to think probably I killed him, right? Probably I'm, you know, I killed him. So then he heard her voice, Art, Art, go home, go home, right? And then so he told the man, yeah, but what about her? 
you know, she's all by herself. So the man says to him, you really want to stay behind and you want to stay with her? You really want to stay with her? He goes, yes, you know, poor girl, she's by herself. He goes, okay, <clears throat> I leave you for her and I bless you for her. She's yours and you are hers. And that was it. So my brother had an out-of-body experience. See that? Just to let you know. So I wanted to share that with you guys. Now, with that said, are we ready? Because I want to unpack John 2 again. I just felt led to talk about John 2. Pass update. You guys probably don't understand how it works here. Pass updates. Anyone who asks questions are going to come on StreamYard and ask me. Do not flood the comment section and do not distract. If you do, I'm going to block you and remove you from my channel. Exactly, Ortho Christos. I was about to kiss your head. This experience, which is biblical. See, I don't go by people's experiences. I test people's experiences, light of scripture. But this experience is not Calvinism because he was given the choice. Do you want to stay? He goes, yes, stay. And they've been with each other ever since. Now they have two grown daughters, grown women, married, and they have five grandchildren. Why couldn't I have an experience where someone tells me, hey, do you want to stay with her or you want to leave? Take me now. Get me out of her clutches, please. <laughs> why, why, why him? Why not me? Okay. Pass. The, uh, the advice I have for you, pass updates, keep distracting me and I'm going to block you and send you back to Mecca. So sit down, shut up, and listen. Now, isn't it ironic how God works? Let me tell you how God works. You'll find in Scripture a pattern. You're going to find a pattern. I'm the youngest of six. He's the oldest. You'll often find in Scripture that God doesn't choose the oldest. Normally, the way God works and chooses, he chooses the younger sibling or the youngest in a family. Now, don't get me wrong. May God destroy my pride and arrogance. I'm not being puffed up and saying, look, I'm special. But I'm, I'm <clears throat> humbled that here I am, the youngest of six. And the Lord was pleased to set me apart to serve him fully for his glory. Out of six, right? siblings, four boys, two girls, I'm the youngest, and the oldest is a boy, the Lord set me apart, and I praise him for that. I praise the Father, Son, Holy Spirit for that. Now, can I share with you a dream that someone saw that had related to my father? A dream about my grandparents. Can I share this with you guys? Are you okay with this? If I share, it's been a while. I have been with you. This is all to prepare you. We got a lot to discuss. And this was told to me by my dad in the 90s when I was still not fully in the faith. I had walked away. My grandparents on my dad's side. My grandparents on my dad's side. I'm named after my grandfather. <clears throat> my grandfather's name was Hasamo. So my dad named me after his father, Hasamo. <clears throat> my mother was pregnant with me, the youngest of six. And by the way, I'm, I'm what they call a pill baby meaning that this was an unplanned pregnancy. After my second to last sibling, my brother, who's six years older than me, she didn't want to have any other children. So I guess at that time, again, not knowing the faith, not following scripture, not knowing what Jesus demanded, I guess I'm a pill baby. So still God, in his mercy, conceived me in my mother's womb. So she, she conceived me. I was not planned. That really, really helps your self-esteem knowing that you're not planned you're unplanned <laughs> even my my conception wasn't planned dude anyway so she was pregnant with me and it was a custom i guess among my dad's side that they would name at least one of their sons after their father so <clears throat> hasamo my grandfather his dad's name was jericho Yariku. so he had a son named jericho now, that was my dad's youngest sibling, Jericho, Yariko. So my grandfather, my father's father, told my paternal uncle, Jericho, get married, have a son, name him after me. But he didn't want to get married. And that was my uncle, Jericho, who never got married, had no children, died at the age of around 42 of cancer in the 80s. So my dad then asked his father, my grandfather, if he would give him permission and the blessing to name me 
after him in case my mother gave birth to a son. And so my grandfather, my dad's dad, gave him the blessing. If you have a son, I give you the blessing. Name him after me. Now, here's what's ironic. In the Assyrian tradition, I don't know if it's in other traditions, on the 40th day, when someone has deceased, they go to church and celebrate Mass on the 40th day. Guess when I was born? I was born on the 40th day after my grandfather died. True story. It was his 40th, and my mother gave birth to me. See? So here, Miss V will tell you. That's part of our tradition. They honor the deceased on the 40th day, even in the Greek Orthodox Church. I didn't know that, brother. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, Greek Orthodox Church. I didn't know that, brother. Okay. So guess when I was born? On his 40th. Talk about coincidence. Now, I'm named after him, Hasamu. I'm youngest of his grandchildren. On my grandfather's side, my dad's dad, I'm the youngest of the grandchildren. I'm the youngest. So Hasamu, I'm his youngest grandchild named after him. So in the 90s, I hadn't given myself fully to the Lord yet. This was my journey. I was coming back. So someone came up to my dad. Now my grandparents have been dead. In the 90s, they had been dead for over 20 years. Watch this, guys. Signs that God has given me. Signs that God has given me, that his hand's upon me. He's setting me apart for his glory as long as I don't resist and turn away from the spirit, but yield to the spirit. And I thank the Lord that I yield to the spirit. And I pray the Holy Spirit will empower me to always yield to him and never turn away, to love the spirit more and more. And I pray that for all of us. Now, he doesn't know I'm the youngest grandchild of my grandfather. So he goes to my dad and he tells, tells my dad a story. Not a story, but a dream. He goes to my dad. I had a dream. I saw your parents. They had been dead for over 20 years. He goes, in the dream, I see, and he's talking to my dad. My dad told me the story when he was alive. In the dream, I see your father and mother in a garden. Huge garden. And full of vegetables and fruits and trees and livestock. In the dream, I could see they were very well off financially. So I go up to them. Watch the story, guys. Dream. And I ask them, I go, in your old age, all of this, all this property that you have, all this field, all these fruit trees and vegetables and these livestock, you're up in age. Who is this for? All this wealth, who is this for? You know what he told my grandfather? Uh, what he told my dad? You know what he told my dad? My grandfather and grandmother told him? And this is where I see God was giving me signs along the way. As long as I yield to the Spirit, not resist, and submit to the Spirit, God's hand will be upon me all the days of my life. And I pray that God's hand will be upon my daughters, that God will love them as he's loved me. In Jesus' name. Now, you know what they said to him? That you see all this? We are storing this not for ourselves. We are storing this for our youngest grandson. This is all that we are storing and preparing for our youngest grandson. It's for him. <clears throat> Talk about communion of saints. This is what he was told in the dream when he saw my grandparents. Talk about those who go before us. And live in the heavenly paradise, right? <clears throat> Glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ. Do they continue to pray for us and are concerned with us? Well, if this dream is an indication, my grandparents were still praying for me. Were still thinking of me and praying to the Lord <clears throat> for me. And I happen to be named after him. So there you go. Right? So... That, that's not why I believe in the communion of saints. I believe because it's biblical and it's historical. But here you go, my grandparents. I'm named after my grandfather, my father's father, Hasamu Hasamu. And he and my grandmother are praying for me and storing up for me heavenly riches. Glory to the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. <clears throat> so anyway, with that said, let's begin. All right? Let's pray. And I'm going to put you in the background for a second, brother, if you don't mind. All righty. So let's pray. 
in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil one for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory <clears throat> both now and forever unto ages of ages in the name of the father and of the son of the holy spirit eternal glorious beautiful majestic spirit of the father and the son please bless this session take over this session take over our min our ministries our lives Take over the lives of our loved ones, my daughters, Holy Spirit. We yield to you. Perfect us, sanctify us, purify us, purge us of our flesh, of the stain of our flesh, of the fruits of our flesh, and sh shield us with a wall of fire from your glorious, beautiful, sovereign presence. Shield our loved ones, my daughters, with a wall of fire from your glorious, beautiful, sovereign presence, protecting us from Satan. Enable us to hate Satan to resist him with perfect resistance and submit to you and to your word with perfect submission and feed all of us, Holy Spirit. Feed our loved ones. Feed my daughters, the holy flesh of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and give to them, my daughters, our loved ones, and to us the blood of Jesus Christ for our healing, for our medicine, for our wholeness, for our nourishment and food, spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, and physically, for our protection, redemption, and deliverance, and Holy Spirit. Illuminate our hearts and our minds. Open the eyes of our hearts and our minds. Perfect our sight physically and spiritually. And give us wisdom, knowledge, understanding into the scriptures that you inspired and preserved. To know your voice in scripture. To be enslaved to that voice in scripture. To be empowered, transformed by that voice in scripture. To love that voice in scripture. That will drown out all other voices. The voice of Satan, of the world, of temptation in our own flesh. And to be controlled and guided by your voice in Scripture. And proclaim your voice in Scripture accurately, without error, without stammering, without confusion, without stuttering. Save me from misinformation. Strengthen my throat with health and vigor, Holy Spirit. And strengthen my voice to be full of passion to bless your servants. Blow our minds away with the miraculous depth of Scripture. And enable us to then live it out for the glory of Jesus, not for the praise of men. And never allow us to utter any wicked, filthy, blasphemous, idolatrous word. Control our tongues and our mouths. Cleanse our tongues and our mouths in the blood of Jesus Christ. Seal our tongues and our mouths to never betray or deny or disown or blaspheme or shame the Lord Jesus Christ. And do not allow us to fall into any scandal or prostitute ourselves for fame, for attention, for money, not to be politically correct and not to be unnecessarily offensive. Please, Holy Spirit, constrain our emotions that our emotions will not sin and grieve your heart. <clears throat> Sanctify our emotions. To use the full orb of our emotions. To love the Father. To love the Son, the Lord Jesus. To love you and worship you. Bless the internet connection. The audiovisual qualities. Bring them, Holy Spirit. And use my mouth to bless your servants. And convict Muslims to see why Muhammad is an antichrist. In hell under your wrath where he belongs. May the Father. May the Son, the Lord Jesus. May you, eternal Spirit of the Father and Son. Save Muslims. Save these victims. These children. Save these women from Muhammad and his fake God and strengthen the church to be church militant, bold, fearless, courageous, and never, never shrink back. Even if they torture us, imprison us, or murder us, give us the power that you gave the holy prophets, the holy apostles, the church fathers to love Jesus even unto death. And keep us pure for his glory. Guide this conversation, Holy Spirit. Guide it for the glory of the Father, the glory of the Son, and your glory that you possess and unit the Father and the Son, and bring them and use me. Let the light of Jesus shine in us and through us, to destroy the darkness in us and around us, and beatify us with the beauty of Jesus Christ. Grant us perfect self-control, self-discipline, self-restraint, and enable me to stay healthy and keep getting healthier and use my health to glorify Christ. And that Satan will not use our health against us. We need you, Holy Spirit. You don't need us. Use me to bless your household. Bless Protestant believer. Bless, bless prophet Google. Heal them. Provide for them, feed them, and nourish them, and sustain them. And all of us who are hurting, we need you. We need Jesus. We need the Father. And we love you, Spirit. Give us the power to love you the way you deserve to be loved. To love Jesus the way he deserves to be loved. To love Abba, Father, the way he deserves to be loved. Because we do not love you enough to our shame. We thank you. In the name of the Father, 
and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I hope those miraculous stories, bona fide stories that are easily confirmed, like the story you just heard from that pastor where his friend got miraculously healed. 15 years later, he's miraculously healed. You can verify it now. The man is still alive. My brother is still alive. In fact, I'll do this. One day I'll ask my brother if I can interview him without him showing his ugly face. And you'll hear it from the horse's mouth. Now, with that said, I do want to revisit before I open up to the Muslims. Muslims, don't go anywhere. We're just beginning. We're just beginning. I'm going to use the Quran to prove that according to the criteria of the Quran, Jesus is God. According to the criteria of the Quran, don't go anywhere. The articles documenting this are in the description box. We'll open them up in a minute. But I do want to talk about John 2 again in reference to the Blessed Mother, how she is the fulfillment of Eve, that Eve is a type and she's a reality. She's the greater Eve by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I've already discussed John 2. I've already discussed John 2. But remember, we're creatures of repetition. We need to hear something repetitively until by the power of the Holy Spirit it sinks in and we fully absorb it for the glory of Christ. And once I'm done with this, we open up to Islam. So Muslims, get ready. Take beer, Michelob. Now, before you do that, I want you to do John 1. Confirmed by what? John 1, 19 to 51. Now, let's count the days, guys. John 1, 19 to 51. Are you ready? Let's count the days. Now, when you look at verse 19, what does it say? Now, this is the testimony of John, right? Right. John bears witness. So now let's go to John 129. John 129. Count the days with me, guys. Count the days. The next day. So this is the second day, right? Now I'm not too good at math. Help me at math. The next day. So this is the second day. That's two. Yep. John saw Jesus coming toward him. Okay, so this is the second day. Now I want you to go to John 135. Again, the next day. So wait, the next day and the day after, how many is that? That's three days. You sure, bro? Yeah, one, two, and three. Three a day. Now scroll down slowly. I'll tell you when to stop. Okay, go down slowly. <clears throat> Keep going. 43, the following day. Ingrid, why do you keep saying, hi, Sam, from Riverside, California? What are you trying to propose? You're trying to say, look, Sam, I'm in Riverside, California. I'm a godly woman who loves Jesus. Will you marry me? Because she always says, hi, Sam, from Riverside, California, with tears. What are you? You got a picture of me that you're burning incense to? Destroy that idol. All right. Now, guys, the following day, how many is that? How many is that, guy? Um, guy? Before the rap. How many? Are you sure? Are you doubting? Four days. Okay, everyone got it? This is the fourth day? Did we count this is the fourth day? Everyone got it? Now go to John 2. Open up just John 2, the entire chapter. Yes, please, if it's a Jezebel, I'd rather live in a <clears throat> cave with Protestant believer the rest of my days. John 2. All right, now remember, four days, right? Now, on the third day, now did you catch it? The third day from the fourth day. Now count, guys. I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed. On the third day. So if we add four and three, that's the seventh day. Okay. One, two, three, four. Third day. Five, six, seven. So notice this wedding takes place on the seventh day, which is the third day, right? Guys, follow me. The wedding in Cana of Galilee, which the Blessed Mother, Jesus and his disciples attended, was on the third day, which was the seventh day from John 1, 19. So if you count John 1, 19 and 51, there were four days. Three days later, there's a wedding in Cana. Three days later, there's a wedding in Cana. So four and three is seven. Seventh day, third day. Seventh day, third day. Now, second important fact. Guys, we're going into meat. If you're not listening, it's going to go over your head. Ask Holy Spirit to help me, to help you, and understand these issues. In the earliest copies of the Greek New Testament, there are no chapter divisions. There are no chapter divisions. Okay? There are no chapter divisions. So, 
In fact, if you look at a copy of one of the books of the New Testament in Greek, they are written in what is known as unseals, majuscules, okay, majuscules, unseals, majuscules, where every letter is capitalized, capital letters and no spacing. Let me show you an example. Let me give you an example from online. Hold on one second, sir. Okay. Oh, yeah. I don't know if you can open it. Here's a picture. I want to see pictures. Here it is right here. Encyclopedia. Here you go, brother. Just to give you an idea, the earliest Greek copies of the New Testament books are written in what is known as majuscules or unseals, unsiles, where it's all capital letters, no spacing. And there are no chapter divisions and no versification. That was added in the medieval period. Now, if you can open that up so they can see. Guys, focus, please. Focus here. Let me show you. Enlarge it, brother, because, you know, you, you wear glasses. See, that's it right there. That's an unseal. Do you see that? That's Codex Sinaiticus, Sinaiticus, Luke 11, verse 2. Enlarge a little more. Enlarge a little more, can you? Right there. You see? That's Luke 11, verse 2. Notice, the Greek letters are all capitals, and there's no spacing, and there are no verses and no chapters. Everyone got it? Yeah, you can actually get this. on. You can uh, access this online, too, uh, the Vatican uh, website. Yeah, exactly. Sinaiticus is online in parody. Now, guys, let me know. This is class. We want the Holy Spirit to teach. So I need your feedback as an instrument of the Holy Spirit. You got it, right? Okay, so we got that. Okay, now, why is that important? Because a lot of people don't know that John 2, 12 and John 3 are the same context, the same incident, the same event. So if you open up, brother, if you go back to the Bible, I'm going to show you how to. We're going to work, walk through this. Okay? So if you do this, go back to the Bible now. Do John. 212 to 25, and then semicolon three. Just three. Or do three, one, all the way to 21. Okay, now, there are no chapter divisions, and John 212, right here, slow down. John 212 and John 3 are referring to the same event, the same incident at the same time. Now, why is that significant? Go to John 2. 23 to 25. Scroll down. Let me show you guys. You got to pay attention, guys. Please. Okay, here you go. Pay attention. Remember, if you have a Greek copy of John, there are no chapter divisions, no versification. So you have to determine from your reading when one context ends and another begins. The context of John 2, 23 does not end in John 2. It continues John 3. So whoever added the chapter division made a mistake here. Because these chapter editions are not inspired. They were added by fallible men in the medieval period. Now focus, guys, please. Do not be distracted. You're going to learn a lot if you focus. Okay? Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, during the feast, many believed in his name. When they saw the signs, I notice, many believed. Many, not one. When they saw the signs, which he did. So why did they believe? Because of the miracles. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of men for he knew what was in a man. So now notice, many believed because of the miracles he did, but he didn't trust men because he knew man was corrupt and could not be relied upon. Learn from the Lord. If you put your trust in human beings like me, and if I put my trust in human beings like you, you will be sadly disappointed because Jesus himself just showed you human beings are corrupt, tainted, fallen, double-minded, capricious, and apart from the Holy Spirit sanctifying them, tra transforming them, they cannot be trusted because they will turn on you with the quickness, and that includes me and you. So Jesus did not care what people thought about him because he knew they were double-minded and capricious. One day they'll praise him. The next day they'll be shouting, crucify him. That's why in Jeremiah 17, 5 to 6, we are told you are cursed if you put your hope in a fellow human being and look for security in a fellow human being and look for security in husbands or wives or children or parents because humans are double-minded, capricious, and wicked, and corrupted, and tainted. And until unless the Holy Spirit comes upon them and changes them, 
You are not to give your full trust in any of them. Got it? This is why, though I love you and I appreciate you, today you praise me, and it may hurt me, but I do not get surprised and shocked when then people turn against me and attack me like some of my colleagues with my broke bread with. That's to be expected. Everyone got it now? Now, why am I showing you this? Because remember, okay, remember that <clears throat> there are no chapter divisions. So I want you to see why they made a mistake in ending chapter 2 at verse 25, because this goes right into chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Now pay attention again. Let me reread it. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men, and he had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. So Jesus did not care what humans thought because he knew that humans are corrupt, tainted, double-minded, and capricious, and you are not to put your trust in any of them. Love them, pray for them, <clears throat> fellowship with them, but do not put your hope in any of them. Now, what's the relevance? Now, let's read John 3, 1 or 2. Many believed in him because they saw the signs. Now, now notice the significance. Let's see if you catch the significance. Okay. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, now watch, we, plural, know that you are teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So notice, Nicodemus is speaking on behalf of many. He speaks on behalf of many, saying, we, the many, know you're teacher from God because of the signs you did, which shows that God is with you. Are you making a connection with John 2, 23, 25? Nicodemus is one of those men whom John just got done telling you believed in Jesus because of the signs he did, but he happens to be one of those men that Jesus does not trust because he knows that men like Nicodemus are corrupt and unreliable and they need to be changed and transformed. That's why Jesus goes on to immediately say in verse 3 to Nicodemus and the rest who are listening, Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the king of God. You see, Jesus cuts to the chase. Nicodemus, I don't care for what you have to say. I don't care for your affirmation, your testimony to me, because I know who you are. I know those around you. All of you are corrupt. None of you can be trusted. All of you are unreliable. And you must be born again, born of the spirit, born of water. You understand why John 2, 23, 25 should not have ended at 25? Because John 2, 23, 25 segues into chapter 3, explaining why Jesus cut to the chase and told Nicodemus up front, Nicodemus, you need your entire nature changed. You need to be born of the Spirit, born anew, born from above, born of water and the Spirit. Because as you are, you are corrupt, unreliable, and I have no use for you, and I have no trust in you. Are you making the connection before I move on? Are you making the connection with John 2, 23, 25, and John 3, 1 or 2, that this is the same context, same <clears throat> event, same incident, and it should go together? Let's go back to 2, 23 again. John 2, 23, go up, see it. Watch here again. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many, notice a group, believed in his name. Why? When they saw the signs which he did. But he did not commit himself to them. He didn't trust them because he knew all. He knew, he knew man and the nature of man inside and out. And didn't need their testimony for he knew what was in man. Now, let's go to 3, 1 and 2. Nicodemus is one of those men. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know, we, there's the many, we, the many, know that your teacher come from God. Why? Why do you know? You, Nicodemus, and the rest of you believe 
because of the signs he did. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So notice, because we're told already by John, Jesus doesn't trust men because he knows all men. He knows they're all corrupt, wicked, unreliable, and he puts no hope in them. So he cuts to the chase and say, Nicodemus, you and the rest, because I know you, I know you inside and, out, inside and out, I know how corrupt you are, how tainted you are, and you need to be transformed. Therefore, I tell you and the rest, you must be born anew, anothen, above, of the Spirit, and have your nature radically changed, because unless that happens, you are unreliable, you are capricious, you are wicked at your very core. You caught it? You guys caught it? Now, why am I sharing this with you? Because John 2 and 3 is a unit. Starting at John 2, 12, all the way to John 3, 21, it's the same event, same episode, same incident, same situation, same timeline. So the context of John 2, 12 ends at John 3, 21. So you don't stop at 25, John 2, 25. Read all the way. To 21. Okay, so, so far we got it. If I'm making sense, glory to the Spirit for enabling me to make these things clear. By the way, side note. What does it tell you that Jesus confronts a religious leader, part of the Sanhedrin of 71 religious scholars of the Jews, whom the Jews would go to, turn to, and consult for religious guidance and for counseling and decisions affecting their daily life, that this leader is one of those that Jesus says is corrupt, unreliable, capricious, and needs to be born of the Spirit. And until he's born of the Spirit, he's a blind guy leading the blind and should not be trusted and should not be looked to for religious moral guidance. What does that tell you? That tells you that there are people, and I pray we're not one of them, I pray I'm not one of them, who masquerade as Christians, who are in positions of leadership, whether bishops or pastors or priests or theologians or scholars, who are dead and rotten at their very core, who do not belong to the Spirit, who are not born of the Spirit, who are not of God, and yet they are teaching in universities and seminaries, or leading churches when they shouldn't be doing so because they are not of God. They're not born of the Spirit. They don't belong to Christ. But like Nicodemus, they are blind guides leading the blind to damnation. Exactly, Orthochristos. So we got that? Now, why am I taking time to unpack this? Because here's the point. John 2.12 to John 3.21, it's the same event. The same context, the same incident, the same episode. And you're going to now see how it ties in with John 2 and the wedding. Now go to John 3, 28 to 29, brother. John 3, 28 to 29. Remember, it's the same event. Oh, you, you, didn't, you didn't bring it. I'm sorry. Go back up. My apologies. Go back up. Put John 3, 28 to 29. Well, do John 3, 22. To 30. John 3, 22 to 30. Don't erase the rest. Just do John 3. Erase the 1 dash 21. Put 20, 22. No, sir. That's not how you do it. Don't make me lose my testimony again, sir. 30. Now you do it. All right. John 3, 22 to 30. Okay. Same event, same incident, same episode. Now they go to John. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea. And they remained with them and baptized. Now, John also was baptizing in Anon near Salem because there was much water there. And there they came and were baptized, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. Now, pay attention. Who is John and who is Jesus? Read John 3, if you can, 28 to 29. Do you want to read that for me, brother? I'll give you a chance to speak. So 28 to 29. Speech. Yep, your gorgeous voice. John 3, okay. 28 to 29. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. 
Therefore, this is a joy of mine is fulfilled. Now, guys, follow with me because we're going to go into me. John is the friend of the bridegroom. The bridegroom is Jesus. Now that the bridegroom has come, he has the bride. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. Who's the bridegroom? Jesus. Who is the friend? The best man? John. And now that the friend of the bridegroom has seen the bridegroom and heard his voice, he's rejoicing. He's elated. His ministry, his mission is done. Do we catch it? Jesus is the bridegroom and he has the bride. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The bridegroom is Jesus, the best man, the friend of John the Baptist. We seeing that? We catching it? Are we catching it? Now go to John 2 and read for us, if you can. Read for us 17 to 22. So right there you have it. John 2, 17 to 20. Watch where we're going to go with this. And then we're going to begin the onslaught of Islam. John 2, 17 to 22. Read that for me, brother. Well, read 18 okay. to 22. It's okay, read 18 to 22. Well, read 17. Read 17 to 22. Sorry. All right. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house has eaten me up. So the Jews answered and said to him, What sign do you show to us since you do these things? Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Notice, three days the temple you destroy, I personally myself will raise it up in three days. What temple will be raised in three days? Read it. Right. Then, then the Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days. You will raise it up in three days? <laughs> Who's going to raise the temple in three days? Jesus. Now, what temple was he talking about? And I read 21, 22. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them. And they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Okay, now let me tie it in why I took this long route so we can tie it in. Number one, Jesus is the bridegroom. John is the friend of the bridegroom. And the bridegroom is Jesus. And the bride belongs to Jesus, the bridegroom. Number one. Number two, Jesus raised his physical body, immortal, indestructible on the third day. And that's a time of feasting, of rejoicing, of celebration. We celebrate, rejoice that our bridegroom, because we the church are the bride of Christ, has been raised on the third day, immortal, indestructible. Third day, bridegroom raised from the dead, never to die again. A time of feasting, a time of celebrating, a time of rejoicing. How much more will the bride be elated that her bridegroom has been raised on the third day? Right? Now let's go back to John 2, verses 1 to 11. John 2, verse 1 to 11. Let's see if you're catching it. John 2, verse 111. Jesus, the bridegroom, the bride belongs to him. The bridegroom raised on the third day, never to die again, destroying physical death, the grave, and Satan. A time of feasting and celebrating because the bridegroom is alive and the bride is elated, rejoicing that her bridegroom, her husband, has been raised on the third day. When did the wedding take place, guys? On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. A wedding that takes place on the third day. But this wedding, which is on the third day, took place seven days later from the time John the Baptist bore witness that he was sent to prepare for the bridegroom, Jesus Christ. Seven day, third day. You making that connection before I move on? First connection. So if you read John 1, 19, all the way to John 3, 30, here the Holy Spirit inspired these historical events to paint a greater spiritual picture. A wedding takes place on the third day. Jesus and his mother and disciples attend. And from the time that John the Baptist bears witness to the bridegroom, Jesus, the husband, that he was sent to prepare for him to the time of the wedding. It's the seventh day. Seventh day, third day. Now watch here. Now we're going to continue. 
Now, both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Now, notice the blessed mother doesn't tell him what to do. She simply says, they have no wine. Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Now, watch. He calls her woman. Seventh day, third day, wedding, bridegroom, bride, woman. Woman, keep in, keep this in mind. I've done a session on this, but I'm doing it again. I wanted to. Now watch the seventh day and its signification. So notice, she doesn't tell them what to do. She just said they have no wine. Have no wine. And she leaves it up to Jesus to lead. Now watch here. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Whatever he says to you, do it. Did you notice what she did? She let him lead and initiate and pointed the servants to Jesus to do what he says, right? Because he will lead, he will initiate, he will tell them what they must do. And she points them to Christ. Keep that in mind. Now there were set there six water pots of stone according to the manner of purification of the Jews containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Did you catch it? These six water pots were the pots that the Jews would use for ritual purification. Like Muslims perform ritual purification, the Jews also perform ritual purif purification. Notice it's six. Six, not seven. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. So he filled them with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast, the master of ceremonies. Now watch. And they took it. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, water turned into wine, transformed into wine. Six water pots used for ritual purification by the Jews, part of Judaism, transform into wine. Keep this in mind. Now watch where we're going to go with this, okay? That was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew. The master of the feast called the bridegroom. Are you following me? Bridegroom. John 3, 28 to 29, we're told Jesus is the bridegroom, okay? So he goes to the bridegroom and he said to him, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. And when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior, you have kept the good wine until now. Did you catch it? The six water pots used by the Jews for purification represents the old way of doing things, Judaism, which could never bring you into the rest of God the seventh day. Because the Old Testament is inferior that which comes last is superior. And what comes last? The wine provided by the bridegroom for his bride, the church. That is the best. And that came last, not at the beginning. And it surpasses the old way of doing things, the Jewish way of doing things, the Old Testament way of doing things. Because if you follow that pattern, you'll never enter into God's seven-day rest. The way you enter to God's rest is by following that which comes last, which is superior, which is best, which is the wine of the bridegroom, supplied by the bridegroom to his bride, and that wine is his blood that he shed to give you life-giving waters, the Holy Spirit. Got it? And when did he give you this wine? On the seventh day. And this wine that he gave you is also the third day because he rose from the dead, destroying the power of sin, Satan in the grave, ushering in immortality and the new creation. We caught it or no? Abbas, come on my stream yard. So we can defend how your crown proves Jesus is God and Muhammad's destroyer. 
Don't bark in the comment section. Are we catching it or no? An actual miracle that took place that the spirit designed to bring out greater spiritual realities. Six water pots, six days of creation. The Jewish way of doing things will never bring you into the seventh day of rest. Only Jesus brings you that everlasting rest, brings you into God's Sabbath day of rest. And he did it by destroying sin, Satan, and death on the third day when he was raised immortal. So here's the bridegroom giving to his bride that life-giving wine, which is his blood poured out, which brings about the living water is the Holy Spirit for those who believe in him. And it's only through that means that we enter God's rest. The wine of the bridegroom given to his bride, the church, which is his blood that he shed, which brings about the living waters, the Holy Spirit to those who believe. No, it has nothing to do with John the Baptist and the water that he gave. It has to do with the entire Old Testament system. Okay, everyone got it? Before I move on. Now, what role does the Blessed Mother play? What role does the Blessed Mother play? Are you ready? Because I'm going to connect it with the Blessed Mother. And you see what verse 11 says? This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. So this was the miracle that began his miraculous ministry. This was the first of the miracles that Jesus performed. So this was the start of his miraculous ministry. At whose intercession? The Blessed Mother. Okay, are you ready for me to now tie in the Blessed Mother's role? How she is the new Eve, the greater Eve, undoing what the first Eve did. You guys ready? Come on now, so we can go into the slam. Who's ready? Now, I've already did this before, but I wanted to do it one more time, and it's archived. Okay. Notice the difference between Mary. Why does he call her woman? Because on the seventh day, Adam and Eve were planted in a garden. That was the first wedding, Adam and Eve. When did God finish his creation? Let's go to John, Genesis 1, 26, and read 31. So let me walk you through this, brother. Do Genesis 1, verse 26, and then do 26 and 27, dash 27, and then comma 30, and then semicolon, and then do 2, 21 to 25. Now do me a favor. Read it loudly and slowly so we can hear you because I want to make some connections. Okay. It's slowly. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle over all the earth and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Also, to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food, and it was so. Did you read 31? Sorry, I said 30, right? That was my fault. See, now, my yeah. fault, but I blame you for my sin. Read Genesis 131. Go back up. My apologies. I don't know why I thought 30. Now, just delete 26, 27, 30, and put 31. Yeah. And then before you go on, now delete 30. You got to delete 30, dude. Not the semicolon, the 30, dude. You don't need to delete the semicolon. Allahu Akbar and then the comma. Comma, sir. Now, when you see the two colon, put go back to the two colon. Right after colon, put one to three. One to three. And then comma, space. Now click. 
Watch here, guys. Hold on. We're almost done, and we're going to go into Islam. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and morning was the sixth day. So notice, when he finished creating the male and the female, the last act creation, the female, everything was good. Everything lived up to his standards. And then he entered his Sabbath, his seventh day of rest. Because now let's read Genesis 2, 1 3. Scroll down. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Because in it, he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. So he finished the creation of male and female. The last creative act was the female. Entered his rest, the seventh day of rest. And planted Adam and Eve in the garden. The first couple, the first marriage. Because now let's go to Genesis 2, 21 to 20, 25. I hope I said 25. Yeah, I did. And Jehovah God, the Lord God, caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam. And he slept. And he took one of his ribs or the side. The Hebrew can also mean his side. Cut open his side and closed up the flesh in its place. And then the rib which the Lord, Jehovah God, Jehovah Elohim, had taken from man, he made into a woman. And he brought her to the man. And Adam said, here's the first marriage, the first couple married and <clears throat> brought into the garden on the seventh day. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman Isha because she was taken out of man Ish. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And they're both naked, not ashamed because their minds had not been corrupted and tainted and polluted. It was pure, undefiled. The man and his wife. And we're not ashamed. So you caught it? On the seventh day, there's a marriage. The first couple. Male and female, the woman. Notice what her name is? Woman. And they're living in the garden. Now, how does this time with the Blessed Mother? When Jesus called her woman, that's because the Spirit is designing this marriage that takes place on the seventh day as a picture of a greater reality. Of the greater Adam and Eve <clears throat> to show how this Adam and Eve, this man and woman, undid the curse of the first man and woman. So now let me contrast Mary as the woman with Eve as the woman. Notice the difference. The first woman, she initiated. She conversed with the serpent and she told Adam what to do and Adam followed her lead. This second woman did not command and order the second Adam, the last Adam, what to do. She brought it to the attention of that last Adam, they have no wine, as a good helpmeet. Because remember, Eve was created to be the helper of Adam, to assist him in fulfilling his role as the head of the family and fulfilling God's will for their life. Eve instead usurped the position of Adam. She conversed with the serpent. She took control and she led Adam and told what Adam should do. And Adam sinned by obeying her. Here, this other woman, Mary, did not tell Jesus what to do, but came alongside of him to assist him in bringing about this miracle that began his ministry. That's why she said, do what he tells you because I'm his helpmeet coming to assist him, not usurp his authority. See how that works? You see how that works? Now, Ali, don't make me piss on Muhammad. Come on my stream here because now we're going to go into the Quran. So you see why she's called woman? Because this is an echo of the greater woman who actually comes alongside the greater Adam to help him not usurp his authority, which is why she knew he was going to do the miracle once she brought it to his attention. And he did it. And in fulfilling her request, hastened the timeline because it was her intercession that brought about the beginning of of Christ's miraculous ministry. Everyone got it? What's the point? Let me repeat. Unlike Eve, Mary 
did not take control. Unlike Eve, Mary did not tell Christ what to do. Unlike Eve, Mary did not <clears throat> take lead of the situation and had Christ do what she wanted to do. It was actually the reverse. She brought it to his attention and knew that he would take the lead and assume his role as the one who would do what needed to be done to bring about this miracle. That's why she said, they have no wine. That's it. Son, they have no wine. Woman, you are that woman who undoes the curse of the first woman. What is that between us? Right? My hour has not come. Reminder of, I only act and do what my father wants me to do and when he wants me to do it. However, because of your request, the hour now begins at your mediation, which means by doing the miracle, Mary was not in sin, unlike Adam, who sinned by doing what the woman told him to do, because the Father, Son, and Spirit honored this woman by then hastening the start of his miraculous ministry and going ahead and doing the miracle. We caught it? Is that clear? Because if that's clear, we're done. That's it. So this is a picture of a new garden, of a new Eden, of a new Adam and a new Eve, one that knows her role, that she comes alongside to help Adam not usurp his role and lead him to do what she wants, but assist him in doing that which the Father has sent him to do. There you go. Clear? Is that clear? Seventh day, third day. Jesus, the bridegroom, the bride is the church, which includes the Blessed Mother, and she is the greater Eve, the woman, who knows her role in coming alongside the last Adam, the greater Adam, and helping him fulfill his role as the leader, not usurping it. Now that said, it's time to destroy Muhammad. Muhammadans, time for you to join. Where are you? Come on, now we begin. The link is there. The link to my stream yard is pinned. Now let me show you how the Quran proves Jesus is God. Are we ready? The Quran proves Jesus is God. Now do me a favor, brother. The links to the articles for this session are in the description box. Open them up one at a time. One day at a time, sweet Jesus. I'm only human. You're just a woman. You see them or no, brother? Or you froze on me. I don't know. Hold on. I've got to readjust one of my windows here. There sure, we go. sure. Just blame your computer again. Guys, I hope that was a blessing. I hope you enjoyed your learn and what you already knew by me reiterating it, it sunk in more deeply. Is that clear? Okay. Which one is it you want me to open? Open them all one at a time, bro, so we can show them. All the links to these articles in the description box, we're going to go through it one at a time. Okay. Open it up, bro. Oh, I got this one. Come on, man. Okay, that's one. Now enlarge it so we can see. Okay. Article number one, the Quran confirms the Trinity, part 3B. We're going to use this as one of the articles. It's in the description box, guys. It's one. Okay. Now we'll show them the rest, the other ones. Okay, Stuck up. Here's the second one. Islam testifies Jesus Christ is the creator and life giver. Now show them the third one, sir. Third one. The Quran confirms Jesus is exactly like Allah. <laughs> Article number three. All of it related to this challenge. Muslims, prove me wrong. Let's see if you have enough confidence in your God to refute this kafir. And what article is that? Article number four. Is Jesus God or not? Is Jesus God or not? Any more or was that it? No, nope, one more. All right. Muhammad's attempt of damage control. How Surah 3, 7 suddenly makes sense. Oh now, God. how many times are you going to open it, loser? I just had to get it on the same well, ribbon as the other ones. Now, go back to is Jesus God or not? Let's use this. You guys ready? Come on, Muslims. Come on, Muslims. Prove me wrong. Let's see if you believe in your God that he's real and refute the kafir. Dude, that's it right there. All right. 
Does the Quran prove Jesus is God? Yeah. You want to know how? You guys ready? This is now the finale. We just got five course dinner. Now we're going to get dessert with icing on top. Glory to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Quran provides criteria. All of these facts are in those articles. Take my materials, articles, rebuttals, sessions, upload them, clip them, translate them, disseminate them. Ask the Spirit to help you understand the facts perfectly, correctly, and accurately, and spread them correctly and accurately. Do not misinterpret. May God save us from error and sin. The Quran provides criteria for deity, provides criteria for trusting in someone, looking to someone as God. The criteria that establishes whether someone is divine or not. Criteria. Okay? So I'm waiting for the Mohammedans. My stream yard there, it's pinned. Come here and put me in my place, Mohammedans. Remember, if your God is real, he should enable you to silence me. Now, part of the criteria includes what we find in chapter 16, verse 17, 20 to 21. No, Harry, I'm not using the Bible here. Understand how I'm proving my case. I'm using the Quran and the Quran only to prove, as well as the son of Muhammad, that Jesus is God according to the criteria, meaning multiple criterion, criteria is plural, criterion is singular, of the Quran. Here it is, some of the criteria that the Quran itself presents to establish whether someone is worthy of worship and whether someone's divine. Chapter 16, verse 17, 20 to 21 of the Quran, Shakir or Shakir translation. Now, brother, can you read that for me to see if the cat's by the door? Read it slowly and loudly. Okay. Is he then who creates like him who does not create? Do you not then mind? And those whom they call on besides Allah have not created anything while they are themselves created. Dead are, are they, not living, and they know not when they shall be raised. Okay, wait. Is the one who creates equal to the one who does not create? Is the one who creates equal to the one who does not create? No. The creator has no equal from those who cannot create. Okay. And secondly, why do you call on those who have not created anything but are created, who are dead but not living? You caught it? So notice, who should you call on? Who should you pray to? Who should you worship? The one who's living, not dead. The one who creates, not the one who cannot create but is created. And someone who does not create cannot be equal to the one who creates. Now let's read 25 verse 3. 25 verse 3. Okay, you want to read it for me, sir? Okay. And they have taken besides him gods who do not create anything while they are themselves created. And they control not for themselves any harm or profit. And they control not death, nor life, nor raising the dead <gasps> to life. Wait, 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 wait. So... The ones that they take as gods besides Allah have not created anything, but they have been created, and they cannot control death or life, and they have not raised the dead. Is that what it says? That's what it says. So now let's go through the arguments. You see where it says it's these preceding passages state? Scroll down a little bit. Let's go through them one at a time. Number one, according to the verses of the Quran, pay attention. See, even Rory got it. Rory got it. You got it, sir, you handsome beast. Influence, emphasis on beast. The objects which others call upon besides God, whether other gods, angels, individuals, have not created anything. Number two, these objects cannot bring death, cause life, or resurrect. Number three, these objects of worship are dead. So, Which implies God is the creator. God is the source of life. God is ever living. So notice, God creates. God gives life because he raises the dead, and he's alive. These others... They haven't created, they're dead, they're not alive, and they haven't raised the dead. In other words, if you create, if you give life, if you're alive, then you are worthy of worship 
and you are worthy to be taken as divine. This is the argument of the Quran. Did you guys catch it? Brothers and sisters, you understand? If someone is alive who has created and has power over the dead because he gives life to the dead, that that one is worthy of your worship, is worthy that you call on because he's truly divine. And if he creates, then he's equal to Allah. Because go back to 1617 again. Read that again, 1617. Is he then who creates like him who does not create? Do you the not answer? then mind? What is the answer? Is he then who creates like the one who does not him? create? What's the answer? No, right? No. Yeah. So the one who creates is not like the one who cannot create. They're not equal, right? Not even close. All right. So now here's the problem. Folks, I'm about to show you. In the Quran, Jesus creates exactly in the same way that Allah created. Number one. In the Quran, Jesus breathes out the soul of an inanimate object, breathing into it its soul to make it a living being, just like Allah created Adam. Number three, Jesus raised the dead to life. And number four, the Quran says Jesus is alive with Allah right now. So Jesus is exactly like Allah in that he creates like Allah, breathes life and animates clay objects like Allah, raises the dead to life like Allah, and is alive with Allah. Now, Imzia, you better come on my stream yard. Or I'm going to send you to Mecca to lick the black stone. Don't comment in the comment section. You guys got it? You guys caught it or no? So I'm going to tell you what the article opened up. Just give me a second. I'm going to show you which one. Everyone got it? That's according to the logic of the Quran. The logic of the Quran, sir. Okay, now, go to the article where it says, the Quran confirms the Trinity, part 3B. Okay, there it is. Enlarge it. Let's begin. My stream yard, the link is there. Show up or you're going to get blocked. Okay, but you got to go to the right so we can see it, sir. Can you go to the right now? Yeah, yeah. And then enlarge it, sir. Yeah, I'm just trying to get it large without... Yeah, but when you enlarge it, then you can site. go to the right, sir. Is that as large as it gets, sir? Now, you know how this shows you in the bottom where you... Yeah, see? Voila! Presto! Abracadabra! Okay, now scroll up uh, larger a little more. Just a little more. Wallahi. Wallahi. You're finished. Right, now. You're finished. Yeah. Oh. It's all right. <laughs> okay, let's read. Allah creates exactly yeah, like... I, I mean... Of. No, you didn't go all the way down, man. Keep going, dude. Well, You're not yeah, doing it was cutting it off. There you go. Yes, sir. But I saw there was enough space for you to continue to go to the right. Is that what, or is my eyes deceiving me, sir? No, your eyes are deceiving you, sir. Okay, then, all right, all right, sir. That's it. That's all it goes. Well, go. See, it's, it's go, gonna cut go, off. Go. No, keep going. Oh yeah, you're right, you little loser. Slow, listen, kids, drinking. All right, I'm off, wrong, right. sir. Can I be wrong once in my life? No. Only a stupid moron would say robots are like doctors, you idiot. Only an idiot would say that. Because according to your Quran, it just said the one creates. Is he like the one who doesn't create? So you're saying your God is stupid because there are robots that are like doctors who can do what doctors do. So that's a stupid argument. I mean, talk about stupid people, dude. I'm giving him an argument from the Quran. The Quran says the one who creates is not like the one who creates. Who does not create. The one who creates is not like the one who creates. And yet he says, aha, but I'm going to stump Allah and bury his Quran. Robots are like doctors. They can perform surgery. So, nah, nah, nah. I'm using the Quran and you just pissed on the Quran. I'm using the argument of the Quran. You idiot. And you think you're helping Allah and his messenger. Let's read. 349. To be a messenger to the children of Israel saying, I have come to you with a sign. From your Lord, I will create. Now, the verb in Arabic is khalaqa, akhlaqu. I will create for you out of clay. Anni akhlaqu lakum min al-teen, clay teen. 
in the likeness of a bird, then I will breathe into it and it will be a bird. Bi'ithni Allah, the leave of Allah. Now pay attention. Jesus creates. The verb is khalaqa, create. Create. Okay. A shape of a bird. Then that bird becomes a living soul. When Jesus breathes into it, meaning Jesus possesses within himself the ability to impart life and to breathe souls into inanimate objects, making them alive. He breathes out souls. He has the life-giving spirit in him, and by that life-giving spirit, he then breathes into inanimate objects the souls to animate them. It's right there. Then I'll breathe into it and it will be a bird. Bithni Allah. I will also heal the blind and leper and bring to life the dead. Bring to life. Ah, uh, Ms. V. Ah, uh, Ms. V. Ah, uh, Ms. V. Ah. Uh. Why would you delete Lepanto's comment when he's a brother in Christ and he's attacking Allah? Ah, Ms. V. Ah, 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 Ms. V. Ah. All right. And what does Jesus do? Bring to life the dead. All right. Now keep going. Let's compare it with how Allah creates. You ready? See the next verse? 15, 20, 29. Does Jesus create exactly in the same way that Allah creates. When thy Lord said to the angel, See, I am creating a mortal of a clay. Khalakun. 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 Khalaka. Khalaka. All right. Bashran min tanin. Notice, exactly like Allah, Jesus creates from clay. Allah creates Adam from clay. Jesus creates a bird from clay. And exactly like Allah, Jesus made that clay bird alive, a living soul, by breathing into it its soul to make it alive, just like Allah did with Adam, and breathed my spirit in him. So Allah sent his spirit, and by Allah's spirit, his spirit made Adam a living soul. Fall you down, bowing before him. So Jesus is exactly like Allah. Allah is exactly like Jesus. Now let's read the note right after that. This comes from Samir Khalil Samir. Chapter 6, the Theological Christian Influence on the Quran and Reflection. The Quran in its historical context, edited by Gabriel Sayyid Reynolds, page 146. Okay, now watch here. Look what he says. The verb khalaqa is found 180 times. Guys, pay attention. The verb khalaqa, this verb create, is found 180 times in the Quran. And is always translated in various languages with to create. With the exception of Quran 20 verse 17. It says, I can't see man. Takhluquna, takhluquna, takhluquna. Yeah, I need glasses brother. Anyway, you invent a lie. It always, pay attention guys. The verb with one exception always de designates the creative action of God. Wherever it's used, except in this parable, it refers to God's ability to create, creative action of God. Now pay attention. God bless you, Devin, Devin Cheryl. In 177 cases, the subject of the verb is God. God is the one doing the khalaqa, creating. While in the other two cases, chapter 3, verse 49, and 5, 110, it is Christ. Did you guys catch it? 179 occurrences of the verb khalaqa, create. 177 times it's applied to God, Allah, as creating. That's why one of his names is Al-Khaliq, the creator. But two other times it's used for Jesus creating, doing this act of creating. In other words, the verb Khalaqa is only used for Allah and Jesus in the Quran and for no one else. Only Allah and Jesus, Isa, this counterfeit to the real Jesus, are set to create. The verb khalaqa only used for Allah and Jesus in the entire Quran. In point of fact, Jesus is the only one besides Allah who breathes life into inanimate objects, breathing their souls into them, making them alive. Only Allah and Jesus do this. And only Allah and Jesus in the Quran raise the dead. In the Quran. 
evidently this could only come from Christians. So he's saying, Samir, who's a Catholic scholar of Islam, saying that this shows how the author of the Quran or the authors of the Quran of Muhammad were influenced by Christians. Because this is a story that comes from Christian tradition where Jesus made 12 sparrows and on the Sabbath day clapped his hands and they came to life and flew away. Muslim tradition, which could not uphold this meaning, they only want to test in the Quran. See, Muslims could not admit that the Quran is using the verb khalaqa to mean that Jesus creates, so they mistranslate it. That's why in some translations it says, I will fashion for you. I will make for you. No, it's I will create for you, you wicked lying Mohammedans. Interprets it with the meaning of to fashion mold. Meanwhile, the action of breathing into is in the Bible, as in the Quran, typical of the creative action of God. Thus, the two verbs used in this verse, 349, 5, 110, both reflect the divine creative action and not the human action of a potter, for example, thereby confirming the Christian origin of this verse. Did you guys catch it? You guys catch it? Wow. The verb khalaqa, and one of the names of Allah is al-khalik, the creator. That verb is only used for Allah and Jesus. No one else. And yet Muslims, out of embarrassment, will mistranslate the verb as Jesus saying, I fashion, or I make, or I mold. No, I create. And to prove that Jesus creates exactly like Allah, he then breathes into that clay object that he created by his hands, its soul to make it alive, like Allah did with Adam. So Jesus is exactly like Allah. Allah is exactly like Jesus, or Isa, this counterfeit. So that means Allah and Isa, according to the Quran, are equal. Now, is Jesus alive? Now, I need you to open up your Quran browser. Are you ready? Quran browser. Okay, now I want you to go. Well, hold on. Why am I going Quran browser? It's, no, yeah, yeah, go to Quran browser. Then. I want you to now open up 355 semicolon 4158. Now, you don't need to use all translations. In fact, here, do Arbery. Arbery is very accurate. Click in Arbery. Do actually 349, comma. Then 55, semicolon. 55, semicolon. 4158, semicolon. MZ, I will take the Quran and have my cat piss on it if you don't come on my stream yard and debate me. And then 5110. MC, don't come in the comment section. Come to my stream yard because I'm going to bury you in that argument, Bithni Allah. I'm going to use that phrase, Bithni Allah, to bury your prophet and your fake God. Come on my stream yard or I'm going to bring my cat to piss on the Quran, even though cat urine is better than your Quran. Okay. Where is Jesus right now? In fact, go back. Go back. Yeah, just click the back arrow. Now add. Hilari Khan. Don't erase Arbery. Put Hilari Khan. Now click submit. Okay, now let's read. Go to 355. Skip 349. When God said, Jesus, I will take thee to myself and will raise thee to me and I'll purify thee of those who believe not. I will set thy followers above the unbelievers till the resurrection day. Then unto me shall you return, and I will decide between you as to what you were at variance on. So where is Jesus? Here it is, 355. Here's Hilal Khan. And remember when Allah said, O Isa, I will take you and raise you to myself. Guys, let me repeat it two more times. The Quran says, Allah told Jesus, Isa, Jesus, I will take you and raise you to myself. I will raise you to me. Where I am at, I'm taking you to me. Raise you to me, to myself. Now go to 4159. Scroll down. Wow, that's a huge difference in those translations, isn't it? Green line right there. 4158. Did I say 459? It's 58. Thank you, sir. So I did get the first right, but for one reason, I was thinking of 159. So 4158. Hilali Khan to your left. But Allah raised him, Isa, Jesus, up with his body and soul unto himself, and he's in the heavens. And Allah is ever all-powerful, all-wise. Notice how Hilali Khan, Salafi Muslims, rendered 4158. They give you the explanation of 
what Sunni Islam teaches about Isa right now. In Sunni Islam, hadiths attributed to Muhammad, multiply attested hadiths called mutawatir, say that Allah took Jesus physically, bodily, took Jesus in his body, his soul and body, alive, his soul and body alive, physically to himself. There it is. But Allah raised him, Isa, up with his body and soul unto himself, and he is in the heavens. And Allah is ever all-powerful, all-wise. Now, Arbery to your right gives you a more literal translation. God raised them up to him. Allah raised Jesus, lifted up Jesus physically, bodily, with his human soul and body, to be with Allah where Allah is. So for over 2,000 years, or nearly 2,000 years, Jesus is alive. Human soul, human body of Jesus, his human soul and body, his physical body, alive in his physical body with Allah for 2,000 years. So Jesus is alive, not dead, like Muhammad who's dead and buried under the feet of Jesus in hell. And Jesus, like Allah, creates from clay and like Allah, breathes souls into the clay objects, making them alive, living souls, animating them. And Jesus, like Allah, raises the dead. By giving them life, and Jesus, like Allah, is alive with Allah, where Allah is, in his physical body. So according to the criteria, Jesus is alive like Allah. Jesus is like Allah, equal to Allah, because he creates exactly like Allah creates. And he breathes life in what he creates, just like Allah does. And Jesus gives life to the dead by raising them like Allah. That means, according to the criteria of the Quran, Jesus is God and worthy of you to worship him, pray to him, and call on him, according to the logic of the Quran. Because the Quran is not the book of God. It's a satanic book of porn, of trash, inspired by Saint through Muhammad, full of contradictions, which God now uses to destroy the Quran and Muhammad and all of the Quran to bring people to the true Jesus of history, who's the Christ of the New Testament. Refute me, Muslims. I'm waiting. Refute me. Now, brother, do me a favor. Go back to 349. Watch the difference in how Arbery translates the verb khalaqa from Hilali Khan. Now, watch Hilali Khan to your left, 349. Watch the dishonesty of these Muslims because they follow their father, the devil, a murderer, a liar, and a deceiver. So the kind of God you follow will impact the kind of people you'll be. Watch here. And we'll make him, Isa, a messenger to the children of Israel, saying, I have come to you with a sign from your Lord that I designed for you out of clay. Did you see that? The verb khalaqa, instead of saying, I create, they rendered it as design. Now look to your right and compare Arbery. To be a messenger to the children of Israel, saying, I have come to you with a sign from your Lord. I will create for you out of clay. See the first dishonesty? And Arbery says, and bring to life the dead, be it near Allah, right? And at least they translate that part, right? And I bring the dead to life while let's leave. Now go to 5.110. 5.110. Watch again how Hilali Khan, these Muslim polemicists, worshiping a false god, influenced by Satan, the same Satan that influenced Muhammad, who lie like Satan and murder like Satan until Jesus sets them free. Look at how they mistranslate the verb khalaqa and the word Ruh al-Quddus, Holy Spirit. Remember when Allah will say on the day of resurrection, O Isa, son of Maryam, remember my favor to you and to your mother when I supported you with Ruh al-Quddus, Ruh al-Quddus. Now notice their dishonesty. They add in brackets and parentheses, Jibril, Gabriel, that's not in the Arabic, so that you spoke to people in the creator of maturity. And when I taught you writing, Al-Hikmah, the power of understanding, Torah, Torah, Angel Gospel. And when you made, did you catch it? Out of the clay, as it were, the figure of a bird. But now look to your right. Look at Arbery to your right. Watch what it says here. And when thou createst out of clay, by my leave, as a likeness of a bird. The verb is create. Let me repeat. This verb, create, Khalaqa, only use of Allah and Isa in the Quran. Only God and Jesus are set to create, no one else. 
And only God and Jesus raised the dead to life. And only God and Jesus breathed into inanimate, not living matter, clay matter, their souls, making them alive, living souls, which means that Jesus, like Allah, possesses the life-giving spirit, that Jesus has the spirit united to him, which he can then breathe out, and by that spirit that he owns and breathes out, make people alive, make objects alive, just like Allah. And Jesus is with Allah, body and soul, physically for 2,000 years. So like Allah, he's living. Like Allah, he raises the dead. Like Allah, he creates. And like Allah, he possesses the spirit of life and breathes out the spirit to make alive inanimate objects by having the spirit which Jesus possesses with Allah produce souls in those objects. And this is the cross. I'm confused, brother. Why are you confused, sir? Well, I mean, right here it's saying Jesus is God, and I'm trying to figure Thank out you. how Muslims are saying Jesus isn't God if they're reading their Quran. Thank you. You caught it? Now, let me destroy this objection, this pathetic objection. Oh, but it says, Beeth me Allah, by the person of Allah. Let's destroy that argument, shall we? And we have no customers, so I'm going to wrap it up. These cowards did not have enough faith in their God and messenger to help them. When someone tells you, ah, oh, but it says, by the permission of Allah, be it me Allah. Now, here's how you refute it. Are you ready? Now, go back to my article on Jesus is like Allah. Is he God or not? Is Jesus God or not? Okay. Let me destroy that argument. Are you ready? And then we're going to wrap it up. Unless, guys, if you have questions, Christians, if you have questions on any subject, I'll let you call me on StreamYard. But let me finish this point. Christians, I can extend the time to allow you to call me with any question on any subject, and I'll try to answer by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Christ. But you got to come on StreamYard. StreamYard. The link is there. Not this one. The other one. Is Jesus God or not? You can X these out now so you don't confuse yourself. A little sinner you are, but you're not little. Hmm? That's the one. Okay. Watch this again. Is he then who creates like him who does not create? No. But does Jesus create exactly like Allah? Yes. Do you not then mind? And those whom they call on besides Allah have not created anything while they are themselves created. Dead are they, not living. And they know not when they shall be raised. But hold on. Jesus does create exactly like Allah. And he's not dead. He's alive. Hmm. And those they call... On, have no control on death nor life, nor raising the dead. But Jesus does control death and life, and he raises the dead. Now, Halal, I'm going to take my cat, and he's going to piss on your Quran if you don't come on right now on my stream yard. Halal, I'm going to make you shish kebab. I'm going to make you haram, you wicked, filthy pagan. Come on, you coward. Let's see if you believe in your God, if he's real, to help you. The stream yard is there. Don't bark. I'm going to muzzle your prophet for the glory of Jesus. And there's not a damn thing you can do about it, you coward. But you're a filthy coward. You have no guts. You're less man than Aisha was when Muhammad mounted her. Come on, filth. Come on my stream yard. You filth, coward. Typical jihadi. You're only a man when you have 50 of you with knives to be at people and rape their women, like your prophet who's in hell. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Give us the power and the zeal to destroy this maggot Muhammad, this filth who's in hell. You live, Muhammad is dead. Glory to Jesus. And thank you for allowing us to use this book of trash, this book of filth and porn. Destroy it for your glory and even use it to bring people to who you are, Lord Jesus. Because you're almighty over the Quran. Glory to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. These cowards, they bark like their prophet and they don't have the guts to defend their prophet. Now, let me destroy that argument, Bithni Allah. Number one, Christians, Listen. You need to learn this argument. They'll say, oh, but by Allah's permission. Permitting someone to do something is not the same as empowering them to do it. What do I mean? The Quran simply says in 349 and 5110, Allah permitted Jesus to do this. Okay, now we got this filthy bastard. Let's see. I think it's that stalker whom, whose mother was uh, sodomized by the Shia and his uncle sodomized him. Yeah, he left that stalker. The guy who likes to send me voice messages and talks about fantasies with young girls because his prophet was a whore who molested a young girl. 
Yeah, so it's that stalker. It's not Halal Homer. It's that stalker whose mother got sodomized by the Shia doing muta, and he's upset at me for what Allah and his messenger did to his mother. So it's not Halal Homer. So forget about him. All right, now, guys, let me refute this objection. Be itni Allah, be marish of Allah, is not the same thing, is not the same thing as empowering someone. So let me see if it's this bastard who got <clears throat> sodomized by the Shia. Hold on. Let's see. Yeah, he left. Okay, this filthy coward. He comes in. I'm going to block you, you filth, like the Shia blocked you and your mother after they were done doing muta with them. And you. You filthy coward. Anyway. Giving someone permission is not the same as empowering someone. Let me give you an example. Please listen. And then I'm going to open up to Q&A by Christians. If you have questions or not, we're going to wrap it up. Okay. I permit Protestant believer to drive my car. A very bad analogy, but still it will at least communicate the point. I give him permission to drive my car, but I didn't give him the ability to drive my car. In fact, I'm assuming that he has the ability to drive my car, which is why I'm permitting him to do so. So giving permission for someone to do something is not the same thing as empowering that person to do something. For example, my 10-year-old daughter cannot drive. She doesn't have the ability. So if I give her permission to drive, she still can't drive because she doesn't have the ability. God forbid she'll crash and harm someone if not herself. So giving someone permission is not the same as giving them the ability to do so. In fact, by permitting Jesus to create and breathe life and raise the dead, that means Allah has enough confidence in Jesus that he knows that Jesus has this ability to do what Allah permits him to do. So Allah giving Jesus permission is not the same as Allah giving Jesus power, you stone-licking pagans. What don't you get? Permitting you is not the same thing as enabling you. I permit Protestant to drive my car. Here are my car keys. But Protestant must have the ability to drive for him then to take my car with my permission and drive. Everyone with me there? I think we have a Christian. That's number one. Everyone understand the difference? Alico, everyone understand? Me permitting Alico to drive my car is not the same thing as empowering him to do so. In fact, for me to permit him to drive assumes that he has the ability already. Otherwise, it makes no sense for me to permit him to drive my car if he doesn't have the ability to do so beforehand. So yes, Allah permits Jesus to do the things that Allah knows Jesus already has the ability to do. So he's allowing him to exercise his divine power and ability to create, give life and raise the dead. But it doesn't say he empowered him to do so. Giving permission is not the same thing as giving him the ability. That's number one. But number two, are we ready for the second part of the argument? Number two, even if we want to say, remember the second part, even if we want to say that Allah gave him the ability to do so, let's go with that. Let's run with that. That still ends up proving. Allah made Jesus his equal. Allah made Jesus his partner. Allah gave Jesus the ability to create exactly like Allah, give life exactly like Allah, raise the dead exactly like Allah. So Allah ends up committing shirk, the sin of taking a partner and allowing a creature to share in his ability to create and give life, which means that Allah committed an act of shirk. So he's a mushrik. And if Allah is going to be consistent, he has to now damn himself to hell by taking Jesus to be his partner in his exclusive ability to create and give life. So you don't solve the problem, Muslims. You only bury your religion further in the hole. Is that clear? May the Holy Spirit strengthen my throat. And strengthen my voice, fill it with passion, and may I not be a nuisance to my neighbors. Is that clear? 
So either way, you bury all of the Quran and bury Muhammad and his book. Either you have Allah making Jesus his partner because he gave him the ability to create and give life exclusive attributes of Allah, conferring on Jesus these divine abilities, making Allah a mushrik, committing shirk, by taking a partner to be his associate in his ability to create and give life. Or Jesus already possessed this ability and Allah simply allowed him, authorized him, permitted him to act on the ability that already possessed intrinsically. Got it? Where are the Muslims? We're waiting. No Muslims? Now we go to a Christian. Come on, Muslims. Show me that you have answers. Oh, here we go again. Someone calls me Dr. Shimon, even though I'm not a doctor. Yeah? Oh, you're not a doctor, huh? I thought you were, man. You want me to block you, sir? Who? No, I'm just saying I thought you was a doctor. I follow well, you. you I watch are you a Christian or are you fake? Yes, I'm a Christian. You see my name, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, Here's what I say to a bastard like you. Shut the hell up, punk. Yeah, you rotten filth. You're street trash, no Christian with your attitude. Whoa, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. shut up. Get out of here, punk. Yeah, that's a Christian, right? I thought you would. Uh, yeah, you see my name, right? Yeah, I see your name. Satan, son of Satan. So there you guys go. Filthy punk, arrogant trash. Still acts like he's in the street. You filthy punk. If you're a Christian, learn some manners, you arrogant trash. Anyway, anyone else? It's open. My stream yard is open. Come on, don't pretend to be something you're not because I'm going to muzzle you. Yeah, I thought you was, punk. Yeah, you act like you're street trash, punk. Grow out of your thug life, you thug. And fear the Lord and be a true Christian, you punk. Acting tough behind a screen. Filthy, arrogant trash. I thought you was, man. Yeah, I'm Christian, man. No, you actually, you're a punk. Piece of garbage with that attitude. Punks, man. Anyway, you act like a punk, you're going to get treated like a punk. You act like a thug, you're going to get treated like a thug. You act like trash and want to dump you into... <clears throat> Garbage can, you garbage can. Anyway, anyone else? If not, we're done. The Muslims did not have enough confidence in their God or their messenger to come and defend their God and messenger because they know the Quran is trash. It's of the devil. It's a book of porn, of filth, of immorality, full of contradictions. As I'm about to show in one of my later streams this week, if the Lord wills, Jesus is alive. Muhammad is dead. Even according to the Quran, Asa is supposed to be Jesus is alive and Muhammad is dead and buried. And Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There you go. We're done, guys. No questions. That's it. We're done. So, brother, we have no one. Now, my question to you is, any prayer requests for you? Nope. Just same old, same old, man. I'm ready to, just about ready to do the test. So, I get past that, I'll come up with something new. All right. So, guys, pray. God will give him the strength because he's working long hours. To provide for his family and pass the test with flying colors. Pray that his daughter gives birth to children for the glory of Christ. Pray for Prophet Google that his father will be healed of cancer and the Lord will strengthen him and preserve him. Pray for Prophet Google to provide for his family and to preserve him in love with Jesus Christ. Because he's working behind the scenes. You may not see him. But pray for these brothers and sisters. And so, brother, we're going to wrap it up. We got no people with questions, so we're done. That's it. So, Lord, we only got some tomorrow lined up. I don't know what time. If you want to come, you can come. I'm not saying you have to, but what are what's your schedule like tomorrow? Um, let me see. It's probably going to be close to what it was today. So all right, Ray J. I just told you, sir, that my Streamyard link is there for people to call in. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, dude, you blocked me, dude. Yeah, why don't you go back to the thug life? It's the thuggish, ruggish bone. Yeah, thuggish, ruggish moan, you fake. You can tell this guy's a fake, thug bastard, pretending to be a Christian. You fake coward, pretending to be something you're not. I just said, come on my stream yard if you guys have questions. So before I wrap up, join me. Thuggish, ruggish moan. Here, let's play a song for him. You ready? Guy thinks he's a street thug. 
right? Ready to hear this great song from. Why are you laughing, punk? <laughs> here it is. It's the thuggish, thuggish bone here. Here, let's play it. Are you ready? This is an honor for you, fake. Thinking that you're in the thug life. Yeah, huh, man? What's on, man? No, man, what's on, man? You gonna send it to me? They want to play it? We're not against rap. We're not against rappers. But we are against the you shut up. So scream my mom and let me hear you holler. Not about that mighty dollar. Bro, put the bomb up the other follow. Jank ain't remaining the same. Flaming my day. That's how you look and act, you punk. You're supposed to be a Christian. Repent. Repent of the thug life. All right, here we go. Yes, sir. Hi, Sam. How are you? Hopefully, I'm doing better than you. Oh, <laughs> I've been watching your videos for so long, Sam. So I'm just lucky that uh, I I entered uh, your live stream live today. I'm sorry to hear that. Well, go ahead, bro. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to apologize for my English. If ain't that perfect, but I'll try to speak. Speak clearly as uh, as possible, and then just bear with me, Sam. Are you from Cameroon? No, I'm I'm RJ from Philippines. Oh, you're Philippine? Yes, I'm okay, from Philippines. So are you Philippine, Filipino, or you're Filipino? Filipino, Sam. Oh, so you pronounce it F. A lot of Filipinos they pronounce the F as a P. Like I'm Philippines. You're Pinoy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Majority of the Philippines like they pronounce oh, the the F like a P. So that's uh, right. Uh, Sam, I have a, a, a few questions yeah, about the Holy Spirit. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's been so long, oh, Sam. Uh, listen, when hey, I was not, uh, <laughs> oh, hey, listen, dude. Can yes. Listen? Yes, Sam. Uh, I'm you sorry. So here you go again. Do it again so I can block you, sir. One more time. Talk over me. Okay. You got a picture of you with your hand is all tattooed. Yes, Sam. Okay. So we can't communicate if you're going to talk over me and we talk past each other. Okay, okay, I get it. You sure? Yeah, I get it. I got it, Sam. I got you. Okay. You sure you got me? Because yes. th these sessions, I'm a very strict disciplinarian. See, if I was teaching grammar school, I would put you in the corner with the dunce hand. And the other oh, guy yeah. would send him to the principal and put him in suspension for about six years. But go ahead. Uh, Sam, uh, I just want to ask about the, the Holy Spirit. And that uh, are you allowed to pray on the Holy Spirit? Because I have a friend of mine. He's he's going to the Seventh Day Adventist, and then he's uh, saying you cannot pray to the Holy Spirit because you cannot find it anywhere in the Bible. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry. When someone says you cannot pray to the Spirit because you can't find in the Bible, that's not a way of making your case. You have to make your case by showing that the Bible says. Do not pray to the Spirit. So you're letting him get away with murder because if he's going to be consistent, he believes Jesus is the Archangel Michael. So show me where it says Jesus is Michael in those exact words. Okay, I get it. Where does the Bible say Jesus is the Archangel Michael in those exact words? So if he's going to play that game, then he's being very inconsistent, dishonest, or he's ignorant. I don't know. He may be dishonest or he may be ignorant because he's not that intelligent. To insist that I have to find an exact way of doing things or exact way of structuring a particular belief, otherwise I won't believe it, well, then show me where it says Jesus is the Archangel Michael. But put that aside. Who told you that they didn't pray to the Holy Spirit? 2 Corinthians 13, 14. Okay, 13, 14. Anna Chung, is, is that the same Anna? That's not the Anna. It's a different Anna Chung. We used to have Anna Chung. That was one of my moms, wasn't it? That she ran a YouTube channel. Is that her? I don't know. Anyway, 2 Corinthians 13, 14. Read that for me. Okay, so I'm just... Uh... Uh, filth is back again under another Nick. Yeah. Get the hell out of here, thug. You can come under thousand Nicks. You're banned. Oh, it's you, Anna? All right, here you go. Let me make you a mod. I was like, man, where you been? Here you go, Anna. Good to see you, sister. So they suspended your channel? That's what they're doing. Before the rapture, brother, did you get there? 
Hello, Sam. Yeah, are you there, brother, before the rapture? Brother, I'm going to block you because you're too slow. Are you listening? Uh, uh, I'm just trying to open the application on my on my phone, but every time I try to read the Bible. Man, Protestant believer is making me lose my patience. You're making uh, this man look like an angel in comparison. I'm sorry, Sam. I'm just trying to read the no, Bible. Man, who sent you? Who sent you to try to cause us to stumble? Who you work for? Thank you, brother. Who do you work for? Jay, I'm asking you, who do you work for? I work for uh, for love of Jesus. Okay, besides that, who you work for? Who's paying you? Who's financing you? Who's sending you here to disrupt YouTube channels? No, no only me. Who? Only me. No, tell only me the organization. Me. Is it the Illuminati? No, 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 no. <laughs> Is it the Masons? <laughs> no, Sam. Is it the Bilderbergers? No, uh, no, as well. I'm just trying to to read it for you. I don't no, have any Bible on my. I work for. <laughs> Are you laughing at me? No, I'm sorry. I work for God. Sorry, <laughs> Sam. I just. <laughs> okay, here it is. He got it for you. We got it. Now, okay. Got it Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh yeah. So now, not only do you want us to open up the Bible for you and read it uh, for you, should we also cook your dinner for you and bathe no, you? No, 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 Sam. I, I will read it for you. No problem. No, no, hold on, wait, wait. You want us to have the Bible app for you and the verses for you. What's left? Protestant me will come, we'll wash your clothes, we'll wash your I'm car, sorry. And we'll your shoes. What's left? Well, go ahead. Okay, Sam. Uh, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. That's a prayer. Yes. So he prays to Jesus Christ to give you grace. God to fill you with love and the Holy Spirit to produce communion and fellowship with God and with one another. So where did he see, where do you get, you don't find prayers to the Holy Spirit. Here it is right there. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much, Sam. Okay. That's one. So what's the other questions? Come on. Uh, I have nothing, Sam. Everything is fine. A few questions, I, sir. I, I have only one question, Sam. Sorry. <laughs> About only this, the Holy Spirit. Thank you so much for, uh, for giving me the insights. Uh, about. Okay. Now, I'm yes, going to give you I'm, another verse. I'm going to another verse where it says, we worship the Holy Spirit, but you have to know yes, the please. translation to use. You have to know the translation we use. Because uh, some translations add words that are not there in the Greek. So you're going to go to Philippians 3.3. 3. Philippians 3.3. 3. Yeah, but the Greek literally says, we worship the Holy Spirit. But not in these translations, because you see here, you see where it says, worship God in the Spirit? That's not what the Greek says. It says, worship the Spirit of God. So what he's okay. going to do, but listen, okay. what he's going to do, he's going to scroll down a little more, scroll down, not up, and he's going to see Philippians 3.3 3 in all English translations. He's going to click on that. And he's going to go to God's word. Scroll down slowly. He's going to show you. Keep going. I'll tell him where. Okay. okay. He's going to see. And I'm going to view the article that we wrote on this. It was Father Kappas. He wrote it. Wait, hold on, Salon. There it is. G G W God's Word. G W. God's Word. Click no, on that. Yeah, yeah, click, yeah, click on it so you can see. Okay, you see right there. There it is. God's Word translation. Go down, brother. Go down. Now he's going to read three. Now read three for me. We are the true circumcised people of God because we serve God's Spirit. And take pride in Christ Jesus. What do you serve? God's spirit. The word there is latruo, meaning the highest form of worship that's to be given to God alone. This is literally what the Greek says. We serve, we worship the spirit of God. Some translations add the words in or with. It's not in the Greek. Literally, it says we worship, we serve the spirit of God, God's spirit. That's what the Greek literally says. So let me get you the article on that. All right. Okay, Sam. Thank you so much. Okay, now, who do you work for as I get you the article? I work for you, Sam. Well, then, <laughs> that means I make a lot of money, and I don't make money, sir. <laughs> yeah, I'm broke as well, Sam, so I can't give you a lot of money. <laughs> so then what do you do? You live in mommy's basement? Basement? No, uh, no, no, no. I'm just, uh, I don't have a job right now. I'm just trying to, to search for a new job. We're going to pray in Jesus' name, in the name of the Thank Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. 
that Jesus, our Lord, will provide your need, enable you to find the job and provide. And I pray that for all who need, we come in agreement. Please, Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, please, Son of God, in your love and mercy, please, Holy Spirit, help us all to be able to provide for our families our daily bread and open a door for this man to find work and glorify Jesus in that work by exalting him in the way he works. In Jesus' name, we come in agreement for this young man. In Jesus' name. Now, here's the article for you, sir. Thank you. Here it is. Now, he's going to open it up to, for everyone else, he's going to open it up. Here it is. It's in the private chat. You there, private chat? Uh, what right. do you, what, okay, Sam. You see the private chat, sir? Yes, Sam. I, I, I've seen it. Okay, now click on that link. There's the article, and he's going to open up, and that's it. And we have no more questions. Guys, oh, Father Capus Father Capus wrote an article, Holy Spirit Worship as God, and he shows the Greek. Hold on. Did I do this? Hold on. Is this the right one? Slow down. Go Scroll down a little bit. I think I did the wrong one. Hold on, sir. You know what? Because I'm a very stupid man. I think so. Hold on. Are you saying you agree that I'm stupid? Oh, it is it. That's it. Yeah, it is. It's Philippians 3. That is it. This is it, sir. This is the article. I was okay. Say, this looks like it, man. This is it, friend. Is it? Philippians 3. So there you go. This is it, buddy. This article, Father Capus wrote it, and he shows that Greek is we serve, la trua, worship the Spirit of God. That's what it literally says Spirit of God, all right? Yes, sir. You got it? You got it, Sam. Thank you so much, Sam. No other questions? I have no questions, Sam. Thank you so much. And all that's right. it. And all I want to know is, next time you show up, you better tell me which organization is sending you to cause me to lose my testimony because I think you and Protestant <laughs> are... <laughs> okay, Sam. Right, Anyways, buddy. thank you so much. God bless, Sam. Thank you, thank you. All right, buddy. Okay, folks, that's it. We're done. That's it, friend. You got the article. I just posted it there. All right, brother. I'm going to check out, all right? All right, brother. Thank you. God bless you, man. Peace in the Middle East. I'm going to put you in the background. Okay, folks, you know how to pray for me. Please, if you believe God is using me mightily, pray and ask your prayer warriors and your churches to pray for my daughters and me. God grant us miraculous, divine, supernatural, physical strength, health, safety, security, to never back down, never betray Jesus, never deny Jesus, <clears throat> even if they try to kill us. Ask the Lord if he tarries. That I see my daughters grow up to be godly women, in love with Jesus, independent of me, no longer need of me, and that the Lord summons me before anything happens to them. And I see them get to that age of independence, always dependent on Jesus, but independent of me. So they don't need me. They need the Lord. And ask the Lord to grant them salvation at a young age and ask the Lord to give me perfect self-control, self-discipline, self-restraint, to keep the weight off, to get healthier and use my health to glorify Jesus and to be holier to truly obey Jesus and love Jesus and serve Jesus and not to be a hypocrite and never fall into any scandal and disgrace the Lord Jesus that will save me from all temptation, whether sexual or financial, to never pervert myself but love Jesus Christ more and more and ask the Lord to keep my support steady. It remains steady and doesn't decrease. He wants to increase it for his glory and use that support to glorify him, help those in need, my family, provide my daily bread, to do this work of full-time ministry as I continue to study, research, produce articles and sessions to be used of the Spirit to serve you. And as long as the Lord wants me to serve you, I will until the Lord comes or until he summons me. Remember, you're not my disciples. You're not my followers. We are disciples of the Spirit. We follow him. May the Spirit use me as a vessel to bless you and love you for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. And may he help us to fall more in love with Christ, more faithful, more obedient, May the blood of Jesus cleanse us, our loved ones, my daughters. May the Holy Spirit fill us, our loved ones, my daughters, for the glory of Jesus to remain faithful until the Lord comes or until he summons us. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. Abba, have mercy. Son of God, have mercy. Holy Spirit, have mercy. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again, physically, bodily, to judge the living and the dead. And he's Jehovah, God in the flesh, to the glory of God the Father the eternal love of the Spirit. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Sit the throne upon our hearts, the hearts of our loved ones, the hearts of my daughters. We love you and we need you. In Jesus' name, amen. Take care.